We shouldn't apply that same sledgehammer approach to these chronic diseases that actually have got lifestyle as a root cause. That's going to have an impact on your alertness, on your mental functioning, on your moods. The lifestyle that is becoming more prevalent around the world is actually inducing depression and a decrease in satisfaction in life. The way we think about disease, right? And, you know, whether we're talking about type 2 diabetes, whether we're talking about uh, depression or, you know, uh, whatever chronic disease you want to talk about, right. I think there's a, there's a perception in society that it's a thing. You know, once you, um, you know, once you cross that threshold, once you've met the criteria for the diagnosis, you've now got this thing, you've got this label, right? And I didn't realize till a few years ago, actually, that, you know, let's take depression, for example, right? Depression is the name that we give to a collection of symptoms, right? Does it? Right. There's no blood <clears throat> test that says, oh, you now have depression, you don't, right? I'm not trivializing this. This is a serious problem, right? In the UK, right? One in mm. four people are going to get a mental health problem really? in any given year. Think about that for a minute. 25% of the population, you know. Why? Why is it so Why? Many, you know, and this is the so point awesome. of all my work, right? Is that collectively, the way that we are living our modern lifestyles is having a negative impact on the way that many of us are feeling. Mm -hmm. for, for me, it's that simple, right? It's not about blame. It's not about saying you are doing this to yourself. It's about this whole mismatch yeah. between the way that modern Western society is set up now compared to our genetic and our evolutionary heritage. Yeah, being just, in nature. Being in nature. Yeah, it's yeah. healing and therapeutic and you disconnect. You know, I just went to Hawaii for four and a half days and left my phone in LA and my computer here and had zero connection to a device. And you're, it's amazing how the body heals so quickly from any stress or tightness or tension or overwhelm or depression feeling or whatever it may be, you start to heal naturally. Yeah, absolutely. And if we literally just said, you know, one day a week we're not going to be on our phone, or one night a week we're not going to be on our phone, we're going to be in nature, I think our health would drastically improve. Lewis, one of the chapters in my book is literally called that, The Screen-Free Sabbath. Embrace mm -hmm. one day a really? week. You know, for one, one day a week, try and go off your screens completely. Yeah. But then I'm also a realist, and I say, right. hey, look, if one day sounds too scary, do an evening. What? Yeah. Do we need it? Start with one hour. Don't have it on during lunch or dinner. Don't take your phone out when you're yeah, eating. Yeah, that's a rule in my family. In my house, I, 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 there's, no, there's no phones or electronics up around the table when we're eating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, it winds me up. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, you say that in, in February this year, I had just been traveling around the country doing a lot of speaking gigs. I've been uh, so promoting my book in the UK, mm -hmm. right? And I was feeling burnt out. Yeah. And I, I remember phoning my wife and I said, Babe, I need a holiday, right? I don't care where we go. I just want it. I want heat. I want relaxation. And we, we booked a last minute holiday to uh, Dubai. Wow. And I went with my two young kids and my wife. And I got to the hotel, right? And nowhere to fly. My laptop and my phone went in the hotel safe. Mm. And it stayed there all week. That's great. And it's a different experience. You know, I was connecting. You know, and I, I don't think we realize the, the, the noise that this creates in our mind every single day yeah you know just how many times we look at them just <clears throat> the studies now showing that if, if we were communicating now and we had our, our smartphones on the table there we would have a less meaningful conversation right just from having it there even if it wasn't being aware around, of it I wonder, just being aware you know what's yeah. going on there you know how am I missing yeah. an email is something so coming a in a buzz or a light at a flash yeah, yeah. but can I say Lewis you know I've just a, a, a patient story that I I talk about in my book, but I think, can I share it with you? Yeah, it's, sure. uh, this is a few years back, right? And this is before I'd had the kind of personal experiences with my own family and my son that forced me to confront some uh, realities about my medical training. And I was in a busy Monday afternoon, what we call a surgery, right? I had lots, I had three or four patients waiting outside. Mm -hmm. You were, you were doing surgeries I, or? So when we call surgery, so I'm uh, currently, I, I used to be um, trained as a specialist. I was doing kidney medicine. Yeah. 
but I was getting very frustrated about how specialized we're becoming mm. in medicine. And I kind of feel sometimes we miss the big picture. Yeah. So I the changed. holistic approach as opposed to just treating the symptom, you got to yeah. treat the whole, right? You got to treat the whole. And we are missing that in medicine. If you just uh, treat one area, it's not going to it's still going to come back. It's still going to come back. Yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of what my whole approach is about is looking at this 360 degree approach to health, right? But some of this is intuitive, right? So I was it was in this clinic, let's call it a clinic, right? It was yeah. busy, busy Monday afternoon clinic. I'm already running behinds. And this 16 year old boy called Devon walks in through the door with his mother. And I see the letter that's there on the file. And basically on the Saturday, this guy had tried to harm himself, tried to cut his wrists. Mm. And he, he ended up in the ER. Right. And he was evaluated there and, you know, basically they had discharged him. They thought he was safe to discharge, but there was a letter to say, you know, come and see Dr. Chastity and can I please start an antidepressant for him? So he was there to pick up his prescription. And now, you were supposed to give them to him. I was supposed to give it to yeah. him, right? That would have been the easiest thing in the world to do, right? I would have, would have taken a few minutes, right? I would be running on time. I'd get back to my next patient and yeah. I could keep going on the kind of treadmill of my day, right? But I thought, wait a minute. You know, I know this family, they seem pretty well, well balanced. You know, I've never picked anything up before that there's an issue here. Why would a 16 year old boy from a seemingly well-rounded, well-balanced family end up in ER? I gotta know more, right? So I, I spent a bit of time, I tried to figure out what was going on. I couldn't quite get to the bottom of it. And I said, hey guys, look, would you mind coming back tomorrow at the end of my morning clinic and I'll spend a bit longer with you? Hmm. I said, okay. So they came back the next day, right? It was a Tuesday morning, end, end of the clinic. And we spent about 15, 20 minutes chatting and I thought, I, I think your use of social media in my head might be negatively impacting your mental health, right? Mm. Did I have a study to prove it? No, right? but I thought, I said to him, I said, Devin, look, I think the way you're using social media, right, might be contributing. I didn't say it was the cause, right? I said it might be a factor. Are you interested in reducing that? He goes, well, do, do you want to think it's going to help? I said, Devin, look, I can commit to you that I'm going to try and help you, right? but shall we give it a try? So I said to him, you know, we come up with this deal and for one hour in the morning, he gets up and he doesn't go on his phone, mm -hmm. right? He comes about seven days later and I say, hey Devin, how you doing? Now he said, hey Doug, you know, I don't know, I'm, you know, I'm still not great, but I feel less up and down in the day. I'm sleeping better. Um, but don't get me wrong, right? He wasn't s suddenly cured, right? I'm not right. saying that, but right. he was starting to show a sign of improvement. I said, Devin, can we extend that out a little bit? He goes, all right. So we move it up over the next few weeks to two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening before bed where he doesn't go on his smartphone, right? And he keeps coming back and he's consistently starting to improve bit by bit. I think, okay, this is interesting. Mm. Again, I didn't have any training for this, right? I was just trying, theory. To, just trying yeah. to figure it out, you yeah. know? I was trying to figure out how to kind of help this guy. I was also then doing a bit of reading, right? I was reading about how our diets can, in fact, can, can impact our mental health. So he comes in and I say, hey, Devin, what are you eating? And he, you know, typical- Candy, McDonald's. Yeah, typical yeah. teenager, right? 16 year old, um, processed junk food. And I drew him a little picture where I said, hey, Devin, did you know that actually when your sugar, when your blood sugar is going up and down throughout the day because of what you're eating, that's not just a blood sugar problem. That's not just a, energy problem, when your blood sugar is falling rapidly, right, two hours after you've eaten, let's say a bagel, right, that's an alarm sign, or it can be an alarm sign to your body, and your stress hormones, like cortisol and adrenaline, can also go up and that can impact your mood. It's like, really? I'm like, yeah, so I drew it out for him, so he got it. Mm -hmm. He said, well, what can I do? I said, hey, well, Devin, look, why don't I help you understand how you can stabilize your blood sugar throughout the day with a bit more sort of protein and healthy fats that he would take with him, things like nuts with him to snack sure. on, right? And bit by bit, he's, you know, came back and said, I, this is, I'm starting to feel better. And then mm -hmm. I didn't see him for ages. And I come into my surgery one day in my clinic, right? And there's a letter waiting for me. And it's his mother. And he said, dear wow. Dr. Chatterjee, I, I just want to thank you. Devin is like a different boy. Wow. He is happy at school. He's engaging with his friends. He's, he's joining clubs at the weekends. Wow. I just want to thank you. And you know, I, in that moment then, I just thought, you know, I know the science now of what went on there, but I didn't need to know it back then. I just thought, this is a 16-year-old boy, right, who could have been labeled with depression, 
right, at 16, right, right. who could have been medication. put on a, a, right. an antidepressant. And, you know, that was five years ago, at least, right? He would have still, he could easily have been on that uh, medication mm -hmm. still today, five years later. I know he's still doing well, right? And I'm not saying that works in every single case. Right. But what I am trying to say is that when, you know, back to the original question is, why, is, why do I say disease is an illusion? We could have said, you have depression, right? That is just something you have got. Yeah. And here's your treatment for it. And I'm saying for him, right, his lifestyle choices that he often didn't realize he was making, he didn't realize the impact, he's made some quick changes in his lifestyle, right? And he's transformed his health. So he, you know, arguably no longer has depression, right? Right. Doesn't mean he can't slip back again in the future. Right. This is what I mean by disease as an illusion. You know, he doesn't, I think for me, you know, I feel that's my job as a doctor. You know, I'm privileged to be able to tap into what's going on. And that boy, if there's a fork in the road, right? He could have gone down one path. Yeah. What does that do to your psyche if you know, oh, hey, I've got depression. That's why I'm like this. You know, there's nothing I can do, right? And again, Just I'm being not, a victim of this. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm not, you know, Lewis, I'm a, I'd like to be a respectful and compassionate guy. You know, I'm not saying there aren't people out there who don't benefit from this stuff <clears throat> or from medication. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's too easy to say you've got something and give a pill. And I, I think 80% of the time, mm -hmm. you know, we don't need to do that. And, yeah. and on, on, on my show, I managed to make, you know, something like a condition like type 2 diabetes, in inverted commas, disappear after 30 days, right? I help a lady with fibromyalgia pains who'd been under doctors for 10 years be pain free after six weeks, right? A 30 year history of back pain, yeah. gone. And, and an opiate and a sleeping pill addiction, or certainly a dependency. Pain reliever, yeah, yeah. Gone. Yeah. When we actually identify what's the root cause of this. And what's I'm, usually the root cause for most people? Is it an emotional attachment that they're holding on to? Is it what they're eating and their lifestyle choices? Is it trauma? that they face that they're holding on to, what is it usually? Or do you see a pattern? It's a combination yeah. of things, right? I, I certainly would say that I think there is an emotional pattern in pretty much every case. You know, again, really? yeah, yeah. I, I really do. And I, again, this is... Any case of disease, essentially. No, sorry, I'm, I'm not saying in any case of disease. I'm saying in the sort of, look, you could have something which, um, you know, I think, I think I need to really, be clear, I'm talking about chronic disease as opposed yeah. to acute disease, right? Yeah. So an acute problem like a pneumonia, uh -huh. right? Right? You've got a pneumonia, yeah. right? You've got... You've got to clear it up. Yeah. You've got to clear it up. You've got basic, very simply, you've got the overgrowth of a bug in your lung, right? We identify that bug, or we give you a treatment, an antibiotic, that kills that bug, and then you don't, don't have, have that anymore. disease anymore, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, I get that. Right, that's, that's an acute problem. So but you still prescribe medication to things like that? Absolutely, yeah. right? But a chronic disease, so let's take, type 2 diabetes is you know, so common and widespread. Let's just think about that for a minute. That happens when you pass an arbitrary point on a scale, right? So uh, here in the US, right, uh, your HbA1c, which is your average marker of, it's a blood test, which says your average blood sugar for the last three months. Mm. Right, if you're 6.5 or above, you, you, we say you've got type 2 diabetes. If you're 6 to 6.5, you have something called pre-diabetes. Wow. No, sorry, here it's 5.7, right? But the point is, right. if it's just below that at 5.6, we say you don't have anything. You're fine. You're fine, but you're not fine. This is a continuum. You're very close. Yeah. You're very close, right? And so what I'm just trying to get the point across is that something doesn't magically change when you go up 0.1 and you're now in, you know, Pre-diabetes already. <laughs> yeah, this has been building up for 10 years and yeah. I want us to be picking this up one year in saying, hey, look, you don't have pre-diabetes yet, but you're gonna get it within a few years. Yeah. And my yeah. approach really, Lewis, is about four key areas of health, right? I find that what I do with most people comes down to what I call the four pillars of health. That's uh -huh. what I outlined, that's what I did on the show, that's what I outlined in my book. Mm -hmm. Because I think when we can simplify health down, people get it, right? Right. And I cover connection and I cover emotional health, but I do it under the umbrella of relax, right? Relax? Yeah, okay, so yeah, yeah. just to back up, my four pillars of health. That's the first pillar, relax. 
Yeah, and there's a reason I started with relax because when we are tight and stressed, that's when we cause dis ease, right? Absolutely. The more tight we are for the longer amount of years, we build something up in the body that has symptoms, negative symptoms, right? Yeah, and, and can dictate our, our choices. You know, if you're yeah. feeling stressed, you're not having any time to yourself, mm -hmm. right? You will find it harder to make healthy food choices. Yeah. You will find it harder to have the motivation to work out and get your body moving. You and when the brain is a roller coaster, yeah, you're causing disease, dysfunction in your body, right? Absolutely, and mm. you know. It's interesting, the, the publisher first said, you know, we should start with food. And I said, no, 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 mm -hmm. I want to, look, everyone will expect me to start with food, Yeah. right? We undervalue relaxation. Peace of mind. Yeah, we undervalue relaxation in, in, in society. You know, we prioritize, you know, when we talk about health, everyone's talking about food and movement, right? Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, they're important. But I give equal priority to food movement, sleep, yeah. and relaxation. And I think that's what makes my approach a little bit different is that I say, look, you don't need the perfect diet. You don't need the perfect workout regime, right? You need to do enough in each pillar. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what leads to the changes that not only work in two weeks, they're still gonna be working in two months, in six months, in 12 months, in mm -hmm. two years. You know, we can all go on a crash 10 day diet yeah. and feel better. Right? All of us can do that. I could do that. Right. But will that change my behavior? I'm not so sure. Yeah. And as an athlete, you know, we always talk about being in the zone, being in the flow. And the only way to get in the flow is to be relaxed. Because if you're playing basketball or football and you're running tight like this and tense, you're not going to be able to flow at any moment and move and be agile. Uh, so you must be able to be relaxed. Yeah. In order to achieve peak results in your sport. Yeah, so how, I, so I, I totally agree. It actually reminds me of a story that I talk about in, in, cha in the fourth chapter in Relax. It's, I say we all need a daily practice of stillness and I define what that is, right? And in that chapter, I talk about flow state and I talk about athletes and I talk about Tiger Woods actually. And I always remember, you know, as a, as a kid growing up, you know, I would just idolize that guy and think, God, he's just amazing what he's doing and he's getting you know, all kinds of people interested in the sport just for his brilliance at the mm -hmm. time. And I remember, you know, a lot of people used to criticize him. And I remember an interview he said once, you know, on a Sunday on the back nine, I can't hear the crowds. I, 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 I don't know all that emotional commotion that's going on. I'm in the zone. He's in flow state, mm -hmm. right? He is literally just in the moment and, and zoned in. But you know who else is in flow state? my five-year-old daughter or my seven-year-old son, when they're coloring a book, right? right? Or playing, playing building pool. Lego blocks, yeah, yeah. they're in flow state, uh -huh. right? I could talk to them and they're not being rude and ignoring me. They're just completely immersed in the moment and we can learn from those kids. And right. that's the thing about technology, right? It takes us out. We start to get distracted. I love tech, right? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> I love tech, but you know, the whole relaxed pillar, you know, a big feature of that is how do we use technology in a way that it empowers us and it helps us rather than enslaves us. Yeah. And I think for many of us, unfortunately, uh, technology is like a, it, it's just- We're slaves, to... we're slaves to it. And it was a year and a half ago when I realized, I thought to myself, has there ever been a day in the last 15 years since I had my cell phone? I got my cell phone when I was 17 and I was like, have I ever had a day where I didn't have my cell phone on me? And I couldn't think of a moment, one day where I didn't have it on me. And I was like, that's kind of a crime. Like, I feel like that's a really bad sign that I'm addicted to something if I do it every single day for 15 years. Yeah. And it's, you know, I started sleeping with it right next to my head, on my, you know, next to my, on my desk or whatever, in my bed. And I was just like, and I was always checking it. And I was like, something's gotta change. And that's when I took my first trip without it and I left it here. And it was so relaxing and relieving to, to not be chained to a technology. And then I did it again recently and it was again another reminder like I want to do this at least once a year for a week. Yeah. And do these Sabbaths like you talk about one day a week. Even just going out to dinner, you know, with the without friends. Without it. Without it and leaving it home. You know, yeah. like going to the movie and not taking it with you. Like whenever you go out one night a week, 
two nights a week, just leave it at home. And I feel like it's so freeing it's to just like fully a, connect. It's like a holiday. It's like you feel yeah. you feel like you've had a holiday just <laughs> three hours without your your phone. Yeah. Your, your brain just, it all comes down. And yeah. it, it, I, I think what's crazy for me, Lewis, is that in 2018, you know, we have to talk to people. I feel as a, as a medical doctor, I need to write 25% of my, my entire book on relaxation. Mm-hmm. Because I think if you go back 20 years, right? And again, maybe it's a romantic viewpoint of the world before, but let's say your standard family, right? People come home from work. You have dinner together. You have dinner together, right? And then after dinner, if you've got kids, you might put them to bed, right? If you don't, I think people would maybe go and sit on the sofa and put the TV on, right? And have to, there wouldn't be the option of, can mm. I keep working on my business? Can right. I catch up on my work emails so my day is right. easier tomorrow? I don't, you, you didn't even have that opportunity. So I think relaxation almost, we would just, it would be there. It would naturally be, it would be there in the evenings. I think because we've got this amazing technology where we can literally talk to someone with a video 5,000 miles away, which is incredible, right? But it also means that if, we, if we're not careful, it's gonna take over us. And I, I, I actually think with the generation now, we're gonna, you know, technology, social media is pretty new. I don't know, how old is Facebook? 12? 12, 12 years. 12 years, right? 12, I think. Okay, think about something which, what, over 1 billion people on the planet have, or I can't remember the latest figure. 2 billion. 2 billion. 2 billion people. Right? It's just incredible. Crazy. Did not exist 12 years ago. Yeah. And so I think we actually need Almost like, you know, we talk about something, you know, good sleep hygiene rules to help you sleep. I think we need good technology rules. You know, how, yeah. what are some good practices around technology that are going to help us? Mm-hmm. You know, no one's getting rid of tech, nor should we get rid of tech. You know, it's here to stay. Um, Create actually, boundaries for yourself, yeah. Yeah, and, and in, in, the, in, the, in the sleep por- portion of the book, one of my recommendations is a, what I call a no tech 90 before bed. You know, the whole idea, can you switch off all modern tech 90 minutes before bed. Even uh, TV or you mean? No, I don't include TV in that and I explain that why. Relax. Yeah, and also I think, you know, there's two factors with the technology. One is the blue light that we get from it. So, um, you know, one of our sleep hormones is called melatonin. We get that when it gets dark, right? Blue light, we only see in nature in the morning mm. or maybe in the early afternoon. We don't see it in, in the evenings. But when you've got that phone next to your face, that is blue light, that is telling your body it's, Daytime, that's the sun, time to wake up, yeah. right? But, you know, the TV is t- typically a lot further away from you than your phone. You know, our phones are like here, right, aren't they? Yeah. And so I think yeah. TV's okay. But again, if you're going to watch a violent thriller before you go to bed, you know. You know watch out. Watch out. You might have some bad dreams and some bad sleep. Yeah, yeah. So, so one factor is the blue light, but the other factor is that emotional what commotion. Are you consuming, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, on the... I had a patient recently, right? He's like a 42 year old busy executive, right? He has had three and a half years sleep a night for about 25 years, right? He's tried everything, like literally everything. He's been to the sleep clinic, he's been investigated. He doesn't have a, what we call a primary sleep disorder. And here's the thing about sleep that I think a lot of the public uh, and maybe a lot of my profession don't realize is that in my, you know, 17 years of experience of seeing patients, people who struggle with their sleep, the majority of them are doing something in their daily lifestyle, right, Mm -hmm. that they don't realize is affecting their ability to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. So it's not about giving them something to take, it's about identifying what's going on in their lifestyle. And this guy, three and a half hours sleep a night, I'm not kidding you, within five weeks, he was sleeping seven hours a night. Wow. Because, Food impacts your sleep. Absolutely, right? sugar, Sugar caffeine. impacts your sleep. But he was like a complete workaholic. He would literally, after dinner, he'd be back on the computer. He felt he had to be on call till 10, 30, 11 o'clock. It's, and hard, again, to, it's hard to slow down in that way. It's hard to slow down. Yeah. And he couldn't do a note at 90. So you know what? We started off with a note at 20, Yeah. right? And he started to feel the benefits and then he wanted to make the changes, right? So this is the whole point about my approach with like Devon, that, that 16 year old boy. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to set the bar so low with people, right, that they feel that they can do it, right? Then when you do that, you feel good. You feel motivated. You feel, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Uh, a prime example would be, I've got this thing called a five-minute kitchen workout in my, 
in my movement pillar. It, probably one of my favorite suggestions is the five minute kitchen workout. Yeah. And you know, th- where did this come from, right? This comes from this whole idea that a few years ago, I kind of realized that you know, strength training, now I know you're an athlete, but strength training is very much undervalued again in society. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you know, once we hit 30, you know, we start losing muscle mass each year. And mm-hmm. our muscle mass is one of the biggest predictors of how well we're gonna be as we age. Really? Yeah, absolutely. And some people call it the number one predictor of how well you're gonna be is your muscle mass. Hmm. It's, it's an, it's so a, it's important to build muscle mass. Yeah, particularly after the age of 30. So arguably, you know, we associate working out with teenagers and 20-somethings trying to look buff and good in the gym, right? And look good when they go out. Arguably, it's more important as you get older is to train your strength, right? What does it help with? It helps predict the longevity of your longevity life. Longevity and how well you're going to be, how well you're going to age, right? It's one of the strongest determinants. Because why? Because what's the reason why? Well, okay. So we think of muscle as you know dumb muscle, right? It's just that uh, if we were going to shift this table, right, and push it or lift it, we need our muscle. It just serves a mechanical function. Mm-hmm. In the last few years, we've realized muscle is probably the forgotten organ. It's an active really? organ. It regulates hormones in your body. It, sends it burns it, fat, right? It burns fat. It yeah. sends out um, immune system messages called cytokines to other parts of the body, right? It's not just dumb muscle. It, hmm. it helps with all kinds of things. And, you know, we neglect it. Wow. And as a doctor, and I think, you know, I used to give this advice to people. Hey, you know, strength training is really important. You know, you've got to join a gym, right? They come back a few weeks later. I said, how are you getting on with that? Ah, doc, you know, I've not had time, you know, I'm, mm. I can't afford the gym and work's too busy. And again, I never thought, Lewis, I never thought, you know, these guys aren't doing what I told them. I thought, okay, the advice I'm giving them is not resonating. It's not connecting with them in a way that they feel that they can do it. I've got to do a better job, right? So I thought, in that moment, it was with a patient, I came up with this five minute kitchen workout. Now look, there's plenty of other great workouts out there. I'm not claiming to have, you know, if you've got another one you like doing, do it, right? This is not saying I've come up with some unique approach, right? Mm-hmm. But all my tools are to do with what I've seen work with people, with real people, with busy lives, busy jobs, busy families. So I, I would say, okay, look, there are these five exercises. I'd get my jacket off, right? I'd hit the deck and I would teach them how to do it. So like a press up, for example, a press up on the floor. It's actually a pretty tricky exercise, mm. right? It's a bit easy to do it on the desk, but I've got 70 year old patients who can do it against the wall, right? Right? You can do it against the wall. So I would teach these people how to do these like five minute kitchen workouts. And you know, when people, if you say to someone, okay, have you got 45 minutes three times a week to work out? They may say no, but then they don't go and do it. If I say, hey, have you got five minutes twice a week? Is that all you want, doc? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. five minutes twice yeah. a week. So I start that, and I recently, and I talk about this in the book, I got this, uh, this couple in their 60s who came to see me recently. I thought they would benefit, and they were skeptical. I'm telling yeah. you, they were really skeptical. But, you know, I didn't say no for an answer. I still yeah. had the jacket, I was still against the wall, teaching them how to do it. And they said, all right, doc, we'll give you a go. So they, they went home, and, and I gave them a follow-up in four weeks, and they came back and said, how are you guys getting on? I'm like, oh my God, we love it. We're doing it. We started off in the kitchen, and now they do it six times a week. Wow. Upstairs, right, as their evening bath is running, on their upstairs landing, they're knocking out this five minute kitchen workout. And actually often it's 10 minutes. Right. So from them doing zero strength training, they're now doing six times a week, 10 minutes upstairs, right? But I only said they had to do 10 minutes a week, right? Because they feel good, they start to get the benefits. And you know, I've got countless stories like that, but you can, anybody can do it, any ability level. You know, if people like the gym, I love the gym, right? Great, right. but there's a lot of people out there that if we say you've got to go to a gym to stay fit, that's an obstacle. Yeah, well, you I'm know? just never gonna fit then. Yeah. Never gonna do it, so yeah. I'm all about. Simple ways to do it, yeah. Simple ways yeah. to do it, that's my whole approach, man. Why is, uh, it sounds like to me that there are two things that medical school does not do, that if they did, the world would be mostly healed or way better off. One is teaching uh, doctors about nutrition and lifestyle and understanding about not treating the actual symptom but actually treating the root cause of the actions that people are taking, the thoughts, the 
the beliefs behind all this. And number two, teaching doctors how to effectively understand and relate from their point of view and communicate, like you said, in a way so that they can start taking these actions. How come medical school, they're not teaching what arguably sounds like to me the two most important things to change people's health? Yeah. I think, you, Lewis, very, very good point. Um, obviously, there's two factors there. I think the first thing we've got to recognise is that these modern healthcare systems, obviously, look, I'm born and brought up in the UK, right? So that's my bias, but I don't, I've don't. i come out to America a lot and I don't think it's dissimilar here. Mm -hmm. These healthcare systems were set up in a different era, right? They were set up in, a, in, a, in, a, in an era where what people went to see their doctor with was an acute problem. You'd go with a pneumonia with a chest infection. Fix it. Yeah. Fix it, right? So the whole system of these 10, 15 minute appointments, right, was set up in that era because modern medicine worked in that era. It responded well to that. You go in with your problem, you know, you, you get your diagnosis, you get your pill for that ill, and you take it for seven days or whatever, and the problem goes, Yeah. right? The problem is, is that the health landscape of the entire Western world, but arguably the whole world now, has changed dramatically, whereas the bulk of what we are seeing, right, is in some way related to our modern lifestyles. I don't think healthcare mm. systems have kept up. Mm. I don't think medical school has kept up. And I think it's almost like we're trying to hold on to the way it's always been without recognizing, look outside that window. It is different out there, right? The world has changed. You know, even technology, we spoke a lot about technology. That's only what, 15, 16 years old, right? And, 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 or, or social media, 12 years old, let's yeah. say Facebook at least. Right? Surely we need to understand these tools of how social media might impact our health. Yeah. Right? But we don't need to wait for the big 10 year study. Right? We need to, we've, we've lost a bit of common sense. Um, and that's why I, you know, f for me, one of, the, one of, you know, I've shown these results with these, you know, I feel I can make a statement like um, disease you know, how to make disease disappear, right? It's a pretty bold statement, right? What I mean by that is, it's just to really try and challenge people's perception of what disease is. I get it, some diseases do need proper, proper medical treatment. I don't dispute mm -hmm. that, right? Mm -hmm. Modern medicine has given me 15 years with my father that I would not have got without mm -hmm. life-saving modern medical treatment, right? So I'm all for modern medicine, but we shouldn't apply, you know, that works for acute disease. We shouldn't apply that same sledgehammer approach to these chronic diseases that actually have got lifestyle as a root cause. Mm. So, you know, last year I was thinking, okay, I'm showing these great results with these families on television. You know, so in the UK, about 5 million people watch each show. And I kind of thought, well, if 1% of people who watch this make a change in their life, well, I've just affected 50,000 people. Mm -hmm. If 10% do, that's half a million people. And now that show's gone to 70 different countries around the world. I think, okay, this is great. But how do I really create change? And so I thought, okay, there's no, I can keep talking about the lifestyle and nutrition thing about doctors, or I can do something about it. So I spent six months creating a new course, the very first course in the UK called Prescribing Lifestyle Medicine, mm. that has been accredited by the Royal College of GPs. And I just wow. ran that in January. That's cool. Yeah, we had nearly 200 docs attend. You know, 95% of people, uh, said they would highly recommend it to their colleagues. So we're really, really pleased that we're actually now, because those 200 healthcare professionals and docs, they can go back into their world and they can help yeah. all their patients, right? right? And we weren't teaching them. And here's, here's the point that people miss, Lewis, right? It's not even about teaching in-depth nutrition, although I think that would be a good idea. We still have a position in society, whether warranted or not, people often come to check with their doctor. What's, what's the real deal here? Right. I think for many years, people would have been better off going to see a really good personal trainer or a really good nutritionist that come to see a medical doctor for something like type 2 diabetes. And I don't say that with any pride, right? I say that, you know, I've met some fantastic other healthcare professionals who've got really great knowledge right. who can help their patients. But if we don't know at least the broad base of this stuff, we're going to say, oh, no, that's not right. You know, you've got to take this medication, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what we, what we taught is a new framework. How do you plot? How do you see that patient with all their symptoms and then very quickly, within a few minutes, because ultimately that's where the healthcare system is at the moment, right? right? 
yeah, I'd love if all doctors had an hour with their patient. But yeah, I are. also recognize that that's not going to happen for a while. Yeah. So we've come up with this framework where within 10 minutes, right, people can come up with an understanding of what's going on and give them a lifestyle prescription. And it's based around these four pillars, actually, that wow. I talk about in the book. It's, it's that simple that the idea is taking off. You know, wow. I could have made it six pillars, seven pillars, eight pillars, right? But I tried to, and as I said, the whole social connection piece, the whole emotional health piece, I bring up under the whole relaxation piece, such as eat a meal round a table, one meal a day, in company if you can, round a table. And I go with through, no devices. With no devices. Yeah. Right. Sounds. Oh, this sounds like soft medicine. Hey, I'm telling you. <laughs> soft medicine works. <laughs> I'm telling you. I, I didn't know until I did doctor in the house and I go with these families. Yeah. That is not common. What was happening in probably every dining room in the UK and I'm guessing around in the US, 30, 40 years ago. Now we have knocked out our dining rooms. Right. We don't have tables. We've got widescreen TVs. Right. And one family, I, I, well, many families, but one family, right, I was with, they never sat down and ate together. I watched them eat their meals. Everyone's on their devices, you know, people around the living room, some people are watching TV, some people are on Facebook while eating. Um, and just by saying, hey guys, one day a week, no, sorry, once a day, do you think when you guys are together, you can maybe have no device and sit around together? And they're like, yeah, sure, what's the big deal? I tell you, they, they, they told me like on screen, this is transformative. Wow. They start to connect. They, they start to connect with the people around them. Our biology is kind of set up to work with this 24 hour cycle of light and darkness. And if you, if you mess with that, things start to happen to, first of all, to these circadian rhythms, so these 24 hour fluctuations in our biology. So if you're exposed to light at night, one thing that does is it pushes your circadian rhythms later that's not necessarily a bad thing unless you have to wake up to go to work or school the next morning. And if you're kind of seeing light late at night and your, your circadian rhythms are being pushed later, that means the time when you feel sleepy and want to go to sleep is pushed late, later. So you potentially get less sleep. And if you get less sleep, that's going to have an impact on your alertness, on your mental functioning, on your mood. But it's more than that because bright light is also a kind of brain stimulant. It, it boosts your alertness. So if you see light late at night, you're going to feel more awake. But also if you don't see light in the daytime, you're going to feel more sluggish and, and less alert. And there are increasingly studies showing that bright light actually, it literally wakes us up. So, you know, we now spend 90% of our daytimes indoors where the light levels are like an order of magnitude lower than they out, are outdoors. Today is kind of gray and rainy and gloomy. Luminance or, or brightness is measured in this unit called lux. And on a day like today, it's about 5,000 lux outside. On a bright, sunny day in the middle of summer, it could be as high as 100,000 lux outside. But indoors, in the kind of standard office, it might be two to 300 lux. So it's, you know, it's hugely dimmer inside than it is outside so even even on a cloudy day even on a cloudy we day. have evolved to actually have at least five ten thousand lux of light exposure to our you know through our eyes into our body yet you know for many of us living our these 90 percent indoor lifestyles now we might be getting only two three hundred lux so what is the implication of that what does that mean for us well okay so so light can influence the timing of those circadian rhythms um, it can also influence the amplitude of how of of those rhythms. So how kind of high the peaks are and low the troughs are. So what you see in people who don't get outside much, and particularly this has been studied in hospital patients, and and people as they as they age, so elderly pa patients in care homes, their circadian rhythms kind of flatten. So there's less difference between nighttime and daytime in their biology, and that is linked to um, poorer health. So things like depression increased risk of dementia, that sort of thing. It's incredible to think about this because, you know, I think about, you know, from what you just said, I think about my mother and mum lives by herself now and she's, you know, she's become a lot more immobile. So she'll spend a lot of time inside most of the day. And, you know, she also loves this iPad that I got her a few years ago. And so not only is she not exposing herself to this bright natural light in the day, Often in the evening, she's exposing herself to bright artificial light, which again, in many ways, is sort of doing the Las Vegas thing on herself, right? It's mm -hmm. almost flipping what we should be doing. And 
the thing I've I spent a lot of time thinking about over the last few years, and it was really magnified when I was reading your book, is when we talk about health, you know, the, the, the popular media narrative around health always revolves around uh, food and movement. And I've been quite keen to sort of expand that out to include sleep and stress as well. But I think there's a really strong case that actually light and our light exposure is another core pillar of health that maybe we have not been thinking enough about. Yes, I think it is. And and our light exposure also plays into those things, especially the kind of movement side of things and stress, actually. Because, you know, if you, in my book, I, I kind of strongly advocate for very small changes to your life, but basically it m- involves kind of brightening your daytime and darkening your evenings and night times. But one way, one brilliant way to brighten your daytime is just to get outside, do, do a little bit of exercise, get up from your desk. You know, if you start cycling to work or walking to work, even getting off the bus or train a stop earlier and just doing that like last 10 minutes walking, you know, you're getting exercise. You're also out in nature, hopefully. Um, and that's a kind of stress buster. And, you know, there's increasing evidence that spending all day just sitting down, just not getting up and down, again, is is really harmful to our health. And again, if you're just making little efforts to just get up, just go for a walk around the block at lunchtime or, you know, on your on your breaks, um, I think that can make a difference. It will certainly make a difference to your alertness during the daytime. But you're also strengthening those circadian rhythms, which are so important for our health. Absolutely. I mean, you say you would you would imagine that... I use this as one of the tips I give my patients in practice. And it's something I wrote about in my first book. And and there was a chapter called Embrace Morning Light. And it was in the sleep section. And the whole point was to say, when we talk about sleep, we're often thinking about what we do in the hour, hour and a half before bed. And of course, that can be incredibly important. But we forget about what we do in the morning. And I remember when I've heard this from patients, but I also got quite a few messages on Twitter from people after um, they read Embrace Morning Light in the Four Pillar Plan, they said, I've not been sleeping for for years very well and I now go for a 20-minute walk outside in the morning and my sleep's got better. So although there were other things that could be playing a role, it really is that powerful. Getting outside in the morning is, is really, really powerful, isn't it, for setting that circadian rhythm. And I think you had some... Let me see if I've got it here in your book... Um, I've I've actually scribbled all over your book. I hope you don't mind. It's it's because there's so many great, great (laughs) things to talk about. That's fine. I do lots of book scribbling. Um, And you you talked about this German study that suggested that exposure to bright light in the morning boosted people's reaction speeds and maintained them at a higher level throughout the day, even after that bright light was switched off. Yeah. And you also mentioned another study when exposure to bright morning lights, um, basically those who were exposed to it between 8 a.m. 8 and noon, it took them an average of 18 minutes to fall asleep at night compared to 45 minutes in the low-light exposure group. So this is not just, hey, a bit of light in the day. This is actually changing our biology. There's actually another study that I cite in the book. It's a lab-based study, and it showed that if you expose people to bright lights during the daytime, they sleep better the following night. They get more deep sleep and they get less fragmented sleep. And if they do wake up in the night, they feel less tired the next morning, even though they've been waking up at night. So I think it improves the quality of your sleep. But then there's the mood, there's the mood side of things as well. We know that larks, so people who tend to be early birds, wake up early, want to go to sleep earlier at night, tend to be less prone to depression and mental illness and actually lots of there's lots of other advantages health advantages to being a lark um but possibly some of this is because they're you know if you're exposed to bright morning light it push it pulls your circadian rhythms earlier so even if you're a night owl if you see lots of bright early morning light your your circadian rhythms are shifted earlier and i think why that's important for mood is that mood has a 24-hour rhythm like um like sleep and like all these other things. And your like lowest point of mood tends to be around 4 a.m., 4.30, 5 a.m., um, you know, before you wake up usually. And then you're kind of like going up this slope and getting happier and happier during the daytime. If you shift your circadian rhythms earlier and then you wake up at, say, like 6 a.m., 7 a.m., you're already quite a long way up that slope towards a happier mood. But if you're kind of shifted later, if you're kind of like a night owl or you're, you're making yourself a night owl by your light exposure when you wake up 
you're going to be closer towards that tr- trough of, of low mood. It's interesting, isn't it? And I think let's explore chronotypes because I think that's super fascinating for people, this idea of morning larks and night owls. Mm. Um, as, you were, as you were describing that, I sort of wondered to myself, is it that, uh, you know, night owls are more prone to low mood because of their biology or is it because modern society is set up in a way that you know that basically it's preferential to be a lark right i am a lark i'm a i'm an early bird uh, i like getting up early I'm, I'm a total morning person so you know i can get up and sort of you know get hold of the day and by lunchtime i've done loads and loads of work and i feel great um whereas i've got friends and and, and family who, who, who don't really operate like that and you know do you feel that if you don't have that chronotype you are at a disadvantage in the way the world is set up. Yes, I absolutely do. And teenagers are a really classic example of that because teenagers naturally shift their circadian rhythms later. They can't help it. This is just something that happens at adolescence. So asking a teenager to get up at 7am to get ready for school is like asking you or I to get up at 5am. And there's no one, no reason... <laughs> It's no surprise they feel kind of groggy and, and cross when they get up in the morning. It's, it's funny you say that, actually, because it's it's what well, we're recording this at the start of September. So schools have just gone back. And my nephew actually has just moved to secondary school. And after I dropped the kids off at school this morning, I saw him at his new bus stop because he's got to get like a 30 minute bus to his secondary school. And he was half asleep and he was yawning. Now, he's only 11 or 12 years old, so he's not quite a teenager. But I thought... If this was to continue for a few years, I mean, is that the best way to start off a teenager in their school day? You know, I mean, are schools adapting to this research? Are they evolving to this? Do you, very, do you- very slowly. Um, so in the UK, we're we're relatively lucky, actually, on international terms, or our teenagers are relatively lucky because in, in the US, on the continent, schools typically start a lot earlier. You know, some schools in the US, at least they used to start at sort of 8 a.m., 7.30 a.m., some of them. Um, And there have been a number of studies now in the US looking at what happens if you shift the school starting time a bit later, more like 8.30 or 9 a.m., which is what happens in the UK. And it has a really big impact on their their, um, absenteeism and on their their grades as well, actually. There's been less research on this in the UK because schools here start more like 8.30 or 9 a.m. But certainly there are some schools that are starting to take this seriously there's a school there's a private school in london which is allowing its sixth formers to start at i think 1 p.m or 2 p.m and do you know do all their learning in the afternoons and early evenings um but there was a study of a secondary school in the uk which changed its start time to 10 a.m and again you saw this you saw this drop in absenteeism so kids were less likely to be kind of coming in or not going to school because they were sick um but also their gcse grades increased following this change they've now changed back i'm not sure why they changed back but they they changed back and then they saw a a dip again it's fascinating that because on one level society would probably deem late starters a bit lazy a bit um yes and actually but there has been a study that has shown shown that if you have an early bird manager and you're in you're a night owl they will judge your performance as worse than if you have a fellow employee who is an early bird because what that manager is seeing that manager kind of comes to work like you all cheerful and like (laughs) oh I'm raring to go at like 9 a.m and then they're kind of night owl employees come in and they kind of sit there and they need several coffees to wake up maybe they don't get going um until the early afternoon or even the evening and that like not that early bird's manager has gone home and they don't see that that night owl like really really doing their best work in the in the evenings and there's another thing actually which is this thing called social jet lag so I think another reason why night owls might have worse health outcomes is because of this thing called social jet lag and actually to to quote the circadian biologist Till Roneberg who came up with this phrase social jet lag the more of it you have the fatter dumber grumpier and sicker you'll be. Because what social jet lag is, is where your um, sleep and wake times differ between weekdays and weekends. Because if you're a night owl, um, you know, and you're having to get up early all throughout the week, you're probably cutting short your sleep on those weekdays because you're not kind of naturally disposed to feel sleepy until quite late 
in the evening. So you're getting short sleep on weekdays. And then on weekends, you're sleeping in to make up for that. So there's this difference between your kind of sleep and wake times on weekdays and those sleep and wake times on weekends. And you're effectively moving time zones when you do that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, oh, there's so many themes I want to pick up on. Um, I guess on social jet lag, we see this in medicine a lot that certain things get triggered by lions at the weekend. So it's very well known that migraines are often triggered by lying in at the weekends. And once you start to understand circadian biology, you start to now put together some mechanisms as to why that might happen. So people are always told to get up at the weekend at the same time as on the weekday, as a, as a strategy maybe to prevent a migraine at the weekends, which is super fascinating. I didn't know that, but that, but certainly psych psychiatric episodes have been yeah. shown to be associated with jet lag. So, but isn't but yeah. doesn't that all support just how strong um, and robust our circadian biology is, and how messing around with it can have unforeseen implications? Yes, I think it does. We were just talking about how. Um, how social jet lag is literally like real jet lag that you're kind of shifting time zones you know twice a week between the weekdays and weekends um your body clocks will adapt but actually what's increasingly becoming evident is that we now know we have these clocks in all our tissues it's not just a kind of single clock in the brain you've got them everywhere in your you know your heart cells your liver cells your fat cells even have these clocks and they don't all adjust at exactly the same rate so if you if you change time zones, either by traveling abroad or by shifting your sleep-wake times, you're dragging all of those clocks along to a new time zone, but they don't all drag, they don't all move at the same time. So what you get is this, this kind of circadian desynchrony spreading throughout the body, where these clocks start to be out of time with each other. And eventually they will all get back in time with each other. But in the meantime, you know, you have this kind of the way I see the body and these circadian clocks working in the body is a bit like a factory assembly line. You know, to, to do something simple like digest a meal, it requires coordination between quite a lot of different organs and tissues. You know, you've got your gut cells, you've got your liver, you've got your, um, you've got your fat cells, you've got your pancreas that produces insulin. So you need this kind of coordinated talk between these different organs. And just like in a factory production line, if, if things start getting out of time with each other, you get a less efficient manufacturing process and a like less good product. It's the same with our health, I think. I, I think people who've traveled over multiple time zones will recognize that, that even if you start to adjust to the new sleep time, you know, your gut, yeah. your digestion, things aren't quite right so some of it's left behind on your old clock still or it takes a bit longer and you know you can have this sensation that I've certainly felt sometimes when you you eat in your new time zone out of sync with what your body's clock is is telling you is the right thing and the next morning you can actually feel hungover hmm. and you've not drunk any alcohol but you feel hungover because everything's just slightly out of sync. Yeah, and, and I definitely get that. That That's one of the worst things I find about jet lag is that kind of digestive problems. Um, but actually food food is another thing. So light affects the timing of our clock and, and causes our clocks to change time. But actually the timing of when we eat also affects the timing of some of those clocks in some of those tissues. So ideally we want to be kind of syncing our kind of, our light exposure and our, our eating patterns with you know we want we want to be basically getting up eating and then you know when when it gets dark stopping stopping eating i mean that's the way we evolved and i think if you're kind of eating later there's evidence that if you eat later you're more prone to put on weight even though you're eating exactly the same meal um i think really what we want is regularity both in our light exposure but also in our meal times and our exercise so there's some evidence now that exercise also affects the timing of those clocks yeah absolutely absolutely it's very clear light does food is known to to, to impact the circadian clock and you know, I think we're going to find more and more things are. Mm. And I think this really, for me, it really highlights why I think humans, so certainly if I talk about myself and my experience with patients, when you have a routine that's roughly, you know, pretty similar from day to day, you just feel better. You know, when your sleep times are regular, when your meal times are regular, even Monday to Friday, and you maintain that at the weekend. I mean, some people may listen and go, well, what sort of life is that? That's a 
you know, people might think that's a boring, dull life. I don't know whether it's my age or not. I love regularity and routine. I love being able to go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, eat roughly at the same time. And, um, you know, Sachin Panda, who you've, I think, quoted a couple of times in your book, he's and he's been on the podcast, he, he's done incredible research to show that the timing of our meals certainly has huge importance, arguably could be as important as what you eat. I mean, I think the, the jury is still out on that, but, yeah. but it's pretty powerful that just changing the timing of your meals can impact your weight, your immune system uh, and your circadian clock. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think I, you know, so I, so while I was writing this book, I made quite a few changes to my lifestyle, most starting with light, really. Um, and we can talk about my experiment. I would I love to talk about all, that. It sounds like the sort of wacky minute. experiment that I would do with my kids. Like, okay, <laughs> right, kids, daddy's got a new plan today. Like, what is it this time? So, you know, but we will go into that in just I'll a second. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But, but so the first kind of changes I made were to do with my light exposure. But then I got more and more interested in this kind of this idea of social jet lag and also the, the the meal timing and i mean just in the last year i've been i've been recording a, a podcast for the bbc which involves having to get up one day a week really really early to go to london and i i just started going this is this is i know from all my research that this is bad for me but i really really feel it because one day a week i'm having to get up at 6am rather than 7:30 when i normally do and the next day i just feel i feel like i have jet lag and I, I you know so so now i'm trying to i've realized that if i'm going to keep going to london or or having you know some days where i have to get up early it makes sense to always try and get up a bit early yeah. Um, and then, and I, but you know, once you, once you do that and once you establish that regularity, you do feel better. So why don't, you know, you've, you've tantalizingly, um, told the listeners and the viewers about this experiment that you did. So first of all, tell yeah. me what was the experiment. And also I'm really intrigued to know when you came home one day with this idea and you thought you'd tell your husband, is it? Mm-hmm. And your kids about your new idea. What was the response? Okay. Well, and this is relevant to this whole thing of, you know, well, I don't want to go to bed early and it's really boring if I go to bed early because, you know, a lot of us are like, well, I feel alert at night and I want to go out at night and see my friends and stuff. But after this experiment, I've kind of changed my view of this. So my idea was um, what would happen if we go cold, cold turkey on artificial light after dark? That was my original thing. I was just interested in what happens if we get rid of all this artificial light. Um, and so I went and saw these sleep researchers at the University of Surrey and, and said, I'd like to do this experiment. Will you help me? And they said, yes. Um, but what we'd like you to always also think about is to try and boost your daylight exposure, which is how I first came across this this, all this research or emerging research about the importance of daylight. So we devised this experiment where, and we did it in the middle of winter, um, where I would turn off the lights in the house after I wanted to do it when the sun went down, but that, that was kind of impractical because okay. I wanted to carry on my work as normal. And I, I work on a computer, so, so I couldn't really, and you're a journalist and I'm a journalist and I, I, I'm a freelance journalist. So if I don't work, then I don't get paid. So, um, so it was impractical to do that, but that's kind of okay anyway, because, you know, if we, if we evolved un- closer to the equator with a more kind of like 12 hour light, dark exposure thing, I kind of, we, we reasoned that that wasn't such a terrible thing to do to turn the lights out at six. Um, so the idea was that from 6 PM onwards, there would be no electric light and we would use candles instead and then in the daytime I would try even though it was the middle of winter I would try and even though I'm bound to a desk in my work um, I would do everything I could to get as much bright light exposure as possible so that was things like you know after the school drop-off in the morning just you know sitting in the park with my notepad doing my to-do list outside rather than at the kitchen table where it's really dark um and you know going for a walk around the block like i said earlier at you know at regular intervals trying to eat outdoors um also you know just taking you know when i made my breakfast in the morning just going outside with my cup of tea and just you know standing in the garden and eating my cup of tea and my my bit of toast um and also swapping kind of indoor exercise i did quite a lot of exercise um, but swapping going to the gym in like a windowless exercise studio for doing the same kind of exercise outdoors. But I had to convince my family to also at least turn out the lights at night. And I, at the time, my, I think my kids were kind of six and four. <laughs> and my it's not too bad. So, so you can exert some, you have some 
influence over them still at that yeah, age i yeah, guess well yeah i mean yeah i mean i could say this t- is what we're doing uh, and you're gonna have to live with it but my daughter's response was to burst into tears and say oh, oh mummy it's gonna be spooky i don't like the dark and i kind of said oh no it'll be lovely you know we go camping quite a lot it'll be just like going camping you know like having fires and candles and she wasn't completely convinced um my son who's really into halloween at first was like this will be great and he also said if it's like camping can we have lots of marshmallows (laughs) (laughs) so i did a lot of bribing (laughs) with marshmallows but actually by the end of living like this you know we we did this on off for six weeks in the middle of december um well it was beginning of december until mid january and by the end of it it was my it was my six-year-old daughter who was the one who was saying i really like it it's really cozy and and nice in the evening to have the lights dimmed and it was my son who was complaining that he couldn't see his toys and he wanted to watch telly um but you know it actually it actually was a very positive experience for us what what was the impact of doing this so um you know for you and your husband sure but also i'm interested with your kids did you notice anything different were they was their mood different energy were they sleeping better I mean what what went on with the family I was the only one who actually feel I I I did a load of tests on myself so So you you objectively tracked your data I tracked my data I didn't track I didn't track my family's data because it was just too complicated (laughs) Uh, and you know my kids go to school and it's, it's difficult to control all that stuff um but I tracked myself very very extensively um So the impact on me was that, first of all, um, I felt sleepier earlier in the evening. It was December. It was the run up to Christmas, which is a really sociable time. So we did have quite a lot of guests coming to our house. I think in part out of curiosity to find out what on earth I was doing (laughs) and what it was like to live with with candles. Um, But, you know, there were I was definitely sleepier earlier in the evenings. I wanted to go to bed like at sort of nine, 10 o'clock rather than 11 or 12 o'clock. Um, I didn't always do that because of social obligations, but I wanted to. We also, um, we once a week, we took readings of my melatonin. Now, melatonin is a hormone that you release. It's under the control of the circadian clock and you release it in the evening at, at night. And it's basically a kind of biological signal to your whole body that it's time to shift change into night mode. And one thing it does is it impacts on the sleep centers. So it does tend to, you know, you release melatonin and your brain kind of goes, ah, nighttime, it's time to feel sleepy. Here's some sleep signals. And what we found was that I started secreting melatonin between one and a half and two hours earlier than when I lived normally. So that explains why I was feeling sleepier earlier, because my body was was saying, it's nighttime, but this is, two hours earlier. I mean, for people listening, I just want to emphasize how you know, how striking a point you just made. We're talking about a very important hormone in our body. Yes, it's associated with sleep. There are other studies associ- suggesting it's an antioxidant, that it may have some anti-cancer properties, potentially. And, you know, we can maybe explore that later in our conversation, but this is an important hormone that is under this circadian clock that simply by switching off artificial light in the evening, you are shifting maybe two hours beforehand. You're changing an important hormone's secretion by two hours. Yes. That is significant. If a drug was doing that, we'd be talking about it. There would be a list of side effects on it. Yet we're sort of, many of us are doing that every evening on our devices without the awareness of the implication. The amount of steps you need to take on a daily basis in order to not get anxious or depressed or something like this is 5,649. Yeah, so let me explain what the study is. Um, So this was a study that took people who were a little bit more active than your average American, not like super exercisers. I think they were averaging something like 9,000 steps a day when they started the study. And then they asked them to reduce their daily step count to what is typical for the the average American, so around 5,000 and to not exercise. So like if you have the chance to exercise on purpose, don't. And in this study, um, after a, about a week of reducing your activity count to the average American, they actually only got to about whatever that number was you said, it was just over 5,000. Um, 88% of people were reporting symptoms of depression. Nearly everyone had less energy, more anxiety, more stress. They reported a 31% decrease in meaning in life. 
And so, you know, what I, the way that I take that study, and there are other studies showing this too. So can, can, I, can I just yes. clarify? So you're saying these are active people. Relatively who, active okay, people. Okay, so they're yeah. roughly getting 9,000 steps a day. Yeah when they go down to around five and a half thousand yeah, which is actually not just the american average that's pretty much the worldwide average so they go point. down and you, you're saying there was a stat i think you just it, mentioned 88 percent of them are feeling depressed yes and, and then reporting a decrease in meaning in life yeah, and satisfaction so, with life and so this is fundamentally exactly what you're talking about movement is engaging with life stop moving and yeah. you start to disengage with life so i do think that that study suggests it's possible that the lifestyle that is becoming more prevalent around the world is actually inducing depression and a decrease in satisfaction in life. I mean, we know we can talk about why, but there are many reasons that when you become less active, you are you're changing your metabolism, you're changing your brain chemistry, and you're changing your mood in such profound ways that you know, some people think there's a, a very large incidence of depression that is caused simply from being sedentary. So that's not always going to be the cause, and it, movement won't always be the cure. Um, but you know, a certain amount of suffering in society may actually be directly caused by the fact that people are um, are living such sedentary lives. Yeah, I, I spoke to the the researcher uh, Brendan Stubbs. Yes, I love his work. Yeah, uh, just I think it came out a few weeks ago. People loved it because he spoke about a lot of the research on movement and depression, yeah. and a lack of movement can actually start to make some people. Yeah. And again, none of us are trying to say it's it covers everything, no. but for some people, it's going to certainly make a difference and i think we kind of intuitively know that if anyone's got kids you will know this feeling like if in the uk certainly if it's raining or weekends and the kids are inside and they they start to play up and their mood goes off simply you know 10 minutes outside in the garden in the rain and they're like different people but it's also how it changes your brain so one of the things i write about in the book um I actually did some like self-diagnosis. So I found a lot of research suggesting that there are genetic variants that predispose you both to depression and anxiety, um, as well as predispose you to experiencing the antidepressant effects of movement. So yeah. you could basically have genetic risk factors for mental health challenges that make you especially susceptible to the mental health benefits of exercise. So you know, one study was looking at this particular SNP, this particular genetic variant, that if you have it, you're something like three times more likely to experience depression and suicidal thinking. But if you exercise for 30 minutes a day, it almost completely erases that risk. And so I found a whole bunch of these genetic variants and I, uh, I did my 23andMe test, hacked my raw data because my husband is a, a medical scientist and he helped me out with this. And I uh, have every single genetic variant that is associated with both the increased risk and the increased mental health benefit. And so I feel like sometimes when we talk about how how exercise can be an antidepressant, yeah, of course it's true that most people feel better when they exercise, but also it's the case that you can be like me and have be born with a temperament and a, this vulnerability to experience mental health challenges and exercise can change the function of your brain, can change even the structure of your brain in ways that make you more resilient. And if you are going through an episode of depression, that can help you recover more quickly. And that even enhances your brain's ability to respond positively to things like antidepressant medication or psychotherapy. And we know that exercise, it actually, it's like an additive, it's like a catalyst that increases your brain plasticity for anything that's good for you, whether it's uh, a drug that you're taking for your mental health or a therapist that you're seeing. And so I feel like there's that's at a very deep level, exercise is good for mental health. And I and one of the reasons I, I like to talk about this is because, you know, for people who have that that vulnerability or have that experience, when you're in it, you don't want to move. When you're in it, your brain, it's it's such like almost a betrayal. If you're in the middle of a depression depressive episode or grief, your brain will not give you the immediate reward. And so here we can be talking about an endorphin rush or the feel better effect. But if you're actually in a depressive episode or you're grieving, it is very possible that your brain has forgotten how to give you an endorphin rush from movement. And what I want so much for people to know is that that is true and also movement is one of the only things you can do that helps your brain remember how to experience reward and hope. And sometimes you have to get through that part of the process where you are moving even though you don't want to and even though you're like brain you were supposed to give me an endorphin rush and i barely got through it and to know that exercise has such a profound impact on your brain in the long term 
that if you can get through that, your experience changes. You mentioned that genetic susceptibility mm-hmm. and that you had all of them when you looked at the data. Which didn't surprise me. I told my parents that and my mom was like, not surprised. Yeah, but yes. what, what's interesting for me is that you are someone who has had this very passionate relationship with movement, it sounds like your entire life. Yeah. Now I'm interested when that started, but also I'm interested as to now knowing that genetic data, do you think back on reflection that you figured out at a young uh, age, when yes. I move, I feel better, and when I don't, I you know, I don't feel good, and therefore that has shaped your behaviors for the rest of your life, basically. Yes, so I'm sure now, if I were growing up now, and I was the child I was then, somebody would have thought to like send me to therapy. But growing up, you know, I was born in the 70s, growing up, late 70s, 80s, um, kids weren't going to therapy, at least not where I lived. Nobody was (laughs) being prescribed mental health drugs. So it was sort of left to me to figure out what to do with a temperament. I mean, from the time I was out of the womb, I was basically scared, anxious, fearful, Um, you know, there was nothing to explain it except this is how my brain worked from the time I was born. And also, I was not an athlete. So one thing I've I've been um, saying lately, which is surprising people who know me now, I actually was put in remedial gym class because I was so uncoordinated and slow. There were like two of us who were pulled out of our normal class because we could, like just couldn't keep up. We couldn't uh-huh. like I can't catch a ball. It was it was you know humiliating actually at the time. Yeah. And when I was seven or eight, you know there was this wave of aerobics and calisthenics, and I discovered moving at home because my mom would go to these garage sales and buy workout tapes and never do them. She was like, oh, I'm gonna become an exerciser, and she never did. But we would have these VHS tapes at home. And so I started doing calisthenics and aerobics at home, and it was a totally different form of movement. So nobody was throwing things at me. Nobody was timing how fast I could go. It was me keeping beat with music and other people's bodies. And like I fell in love with jazzercise. And uh, it was the first time I didn't feel like my body was this like embarrassing burden that I was dragging around unable to do the things that other kids could do. And then over like years, you know, started when I was seven or eight, um, realizing how much it helped me deal with stress and anxiety. But I needed to find the movement that I could do too. And like, we're not all natural born runners. We're not all natural born um, athletes. But I do believe that there's something in everyone that can be uh, captured, tapped into by some form of movement. There's quite a few things, Kelly, I want to pick up on there. Um, you mentioned something that was quite humiliating. So at a young age, you know, I'm just trying to imagine, you know, you're the kid who, let's say, you're not getting put, you're not getting picked for the team because you're always the last one to get picked, or you're saying that you and, a, and, a, and somebody else got pulled out of class because you're not coordinating enough to continue with the rest of your peers. That is, that is torture at that age, you know, to feel, and, and I guess what I'm getting at is, is there a difference between men and women in in this? Um, we've we've already mentioned the societal narrative around movement and how you know if you can't do what your peers can do and you're you feel humiliated and you're not part of that group, you you might change your relationship with movement for the rest of your yes. life. There is research on this now. So the research now is looking at you know people like our age and older, many of whom had traumatic experiences in gym class or PE. I don't know what it's like in the UK now, but in the US, actually, it's not even required. There there are schools now where you don't necessarily have to even take gym or PE. Um, so that you're not humiliated? No, just because um, there's not funding. It's right. like we don't have art and music class everywhere also now. Um, but I think there's also, there's a big shift right now in trying to create less humiliating and traumatizing experiences because this research shows that if you were picked last, if you have a memory of being shamed because of your body or any other reason that you didn't fit in, there's lots of reasons that, that kids have been humiliated in sports or gym classes, um, that it makes you uh, want to avoid movement and exercise for the rest of your life. Um, so what sh- based on that, if you were to give advice to schools, there's a lot of schools had teachers and, and, and teachers who listen to this podcast. Why? Based upon that research then, have you got any advice for them in terms of how they should frame movement and talk about it and manage it at schools? Because you don't want to shape the, these kids the rest of their life. You don't want to alter their relationship with movement negatively 
if you can help it. I mean, it's, and there are a lot of people doing this work, by the way, I should say, a lot of people trying to improve that, yeah. that gym class experience. One thing is autonomy, that people should have choices to identify movements that help them, you know, reduce stress and feel better and connect with others. You know, the most positive experiences I ever had in a gym class was uh, when we were we were given permission to like just walk around and talk to our friends. That was, I got more activity doing that than when I was hiding on a field being like, cover me, like I hope the ball doesn't come to me because I don't know how to play the sport and I don't yeah. want to get hurt. Um, uh, you know, a weightlifting like circuit, to be able to do it on your own and, and choose what you do and how you do it. Um, you know, th so to give people a sense of autonomy and to allow people to connect. And the other positive experience I had, for whatever reason, one year, my last year in high school, the gym class instructors decided to allow you to choose into what they called competitive or non-competitive. And we were literally put in different rooms. They, they like put the binders up like to close the rooms. And if you, if you opted into non-competitive, everyone was agreeing, we all aren't any good at this and we don't care and we're gonna find a way to make it fun. And I realized that I could hit a volleyball for the first time in my life because I wasn't like hiding in the back with the competitive yeah. players being like, don't let her touch the ball, she's gonna drop it. And it was such an amazing experience because none of us cared. And so we were able to play in a different way. Um, so I, I just think giving people choice, letting people opt into, are you the athlete who wants to use this time to compete and get better and train? Or do you want to just like have fun yeah. with your friends? Or do you want to be by yourself? Could you let kids listen to music on their headphones and strength train and have that time for themselves? Um, yeah. Have it look more like what adults get to do when they choose their own movement. The reason I'm asking about men and women is because there is, I can't remember the exact name. I think the BBC in the UK have a movement like this girl can. I, oh yes, know. I've seen that. Yeah, some, there's some videos. So I, and I, I think, think Australia has that too. Yeah, it's an awareness. And, and again, I don't know the exact um, roots of this. So my interpretation of this is that there is a lot of people saying that women, that girls as they get older, don't particularly, you know, and this is a gross generalization, are, maybe too self-conscious to move, they're not moving enough. And it's, it's a movement to try and encourage more girls, more women to get moving. Yeah. Now, I, just, I, I think they're targeting this at women because it seems to be more of an issue with women than guys. Has any of your research come across anything like that? And do you have any views on why that might be? So and this, you especially see this um, during adolescence and young adulthood when women experience their bodies being objectified yeah. so much for the first time. I, mean, I think of one of my friend's daughters who stopped going for a run. Um, she loved running and all of a sudden she hit adolescence and she started getting cat calls and she didn't feel safe and she stopped running. Yeah. Um, so I think that part of it is suddenly you realize that everyone has an opinion about your body. You go to the gym and people will, and you know, even praise feels can feel quite threatening and mm. unwanted or you'll get negative comments from people and that sense of suddenly your body is an object that everyone is evaluating is I think one of the things that keeps women from participating yeah. in all sorts of activities. There, there definitely is a cultural movement though for women to embrace their strength, embrace their power, embrace their, their inner athlete or dancer and to move in any way that feels good. Um, and I think that um, one of the things I often will talk to fitness professionals about is how important it is to design environments and communities so that if you're walking in for the first time, you understand that you are welcomed and celebrated and not immediately objectified by like, you know, let's take your before picture or, you know, let's take your measurements or the, yeah. the kind of things that can put people in that mindset of, oh, right, my body is an object that's being evaluated as opposed to this is an opportunity to experience my own strength. Yeah. I guess the more we talk and the more I think about what you're saying, it's very hard not to shake off this idea that ultimately movement is very personal. Mm -hmm. And we cannot be, and it's not ideal to be prescribing the same form of movement to everyone, that ultimately we've all got to figure out yeah. that yes, it's a fundamental human uh, quality, not quality, quality is the wrong word. It's a, it's a it is what it means to be human, it is to move, right? And therefore, if we haven't found that type of movement yet that we love, maybe we need to go on that search for yeah. that type of movement that we love. And 
trust that it could actually be meaningful. I feel like so often people look for the most convenient form of exercise. Like I think there's a treadmill somewhere in my office building and I'll yeah. go and put in my time. But like I sometimes ask people like if, if someone were to send you a video, you know, on YouTube, what's the video of movement that you would actually watch and be inspired by? Do you want to see people run an obstacle course? Do you want to see people cross a finish line? Do you want to watch that choreography video? Um, what is it that that lights you up when you see other people do it? And maybe even there's a voice in your head that says, I could never do that. Yeah. Like that's the activity to move toward because it can change how you feel about yourself and what you believe is possible for your future. And, um, and again, to experiment and to listen to your direct feedback and to to follow any thread of joy. I often will tell people who come to my classes for the first time, like if you have a moment in this class where you were like, oh, I see what this could be, like then this class is for you and come back because any movement form, this was so great. Movement movement is like, a, it's a mastery and growth experience. We will pretty much always get better at it and we will always enjoy yeah. it more the more we do it. You mentioned that people often do the kind of movements that they just have access to. So there's a treadmill in the block and it's going, put in my time. Now, isn't that an interesting phrase, put in yeah. my time? Because when I'm traveling, uh, I don't really go to gyms much. It's just, A, I don't really have time and I've found ways to move my body that doesn't require me to go to a gym. Um, but it's sometimes I'm in hotels and I will, you know, if I'm up early, I'll go to the hotel gym just to see what's going on and maybe lift some weights, do something. And it's really interesting, you often see people in there who they look as though they're trying to block out the fact that they're moving. It looks as though this is a tortuous uh, process for me. Someone's told me or I feel I have to be on this treadmill for an hour. So I'm gonna do everything I can to numb that experience, whether it's I read the newspaper, I watch the news, watch Netflix. Now look, I am not being critical here. I'm just saying what I observe and I guess Sometimes we feel we need to block out the movements that, like it, we feel we have to move, but we hate it, so we block it out. Now, I'm wondering, is there any research to show that there's a difference? Let's say you're on the treadmill and you're engaged with that and you're feeling, you know, how you feel, you know, your limbs are moving mm -hmm. and, you know, how, you know, what's going on in your brain and you're sort of processing your emotions versus blocking it off completely so you're numbing that experience. Does that movement do something different from the body in those two different examples? Yeah, so um, if you are look, so there's such a thing as positive dissociation during exercise. And for some people, it's actually really important. So one of the things we know is that your brain changes when you go from being inactive to active, that it changes in ways that makes movement not only easier, but more pleasurable. So when people first start, it, start to exercise, it often is an aversive experience. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stay that way for most people, but you, maybe you have to go six weeks of, of doing regular activity for your brain to start to really reward you for it. So in that time, positive dissociation can be really helpful. That's different than like watching the news and getting angry or scrolling through and answering emails. That's where something like music can come into play or you know watching something really exciting on Netflix. And there's research suggesting that if you can combine movement with something you love that is engaging, that it can actually help you stick to, to movement, have a more positive memory of it. But ultimately, um, if you can experience a state of flow in movement, yeah. that's more rewarding for most people. And it can, it can take some time to find that. But that requires paying some attention to what you're feeling in your body, using it as information to guide your effort, um, enjoying sensations of feedback from your muscles and your joints and your heart that tell you, you know, I'm alive and I'm doing this and this is how it feels to lift something heavy or to exert myself in this way. And, and often like that's how you know you found the right workout for you where you can find a flow in it yeah. where you don't feel like you need to distract yourself from it. Yeah. And you can find a flow in anything. And like, like it can be, there's no, it's not like you can only find it in some meditate, you know, traditionally meditative experience like yoga or Tai Chi. People find their flow in all sorts of movement forms. Um, there's so much of it that's personality and so much about what your body kind of was built for. And I talked to a lot of people who told me they thought they hated exercise until they found and then fill in the blank. 
and maybe it was rowing or swimming like some people need to get in the water and they have a totally different experience of movement in their bodies yeah. some people needed to get outdoors and because of the way that nature changes your your brain activity and your mood suddenly they can find a flow walking or jogging outdoors that they could never find on a treadmill and again for me it's music I, anything can become enjoyable if i have the right playlist we've used the terms movement and exercise a lot during this conversation so far can we use those terms interchangeably or are they actually different things they do mean different things technically i love the word exercise i'm not scared of it so movement is using your body to engage with life it's almost everything right we talked about it me talking right now is technically movement um, exercise is often defined as moving your body for the purpose of the activity that you're doing i am running because i want to run not because someone is chasing me i am dancing because i want to dance not because someone is paying me to perform on a stage right i'm lifting heavy things because i want to lift heavy things not because I'm moving from one apartment to another and I have to lift heavy things. That's what exercise is. It's movement that you are choosing to do for its own sake because of its meaning, its pleasure, or its you know benefits to you. So I think too many people define exercise as forcing yourself to do movement you don't want to do. Yeah. And like, that's not what it is. Yeah, by that definition, <laughs> exercise is not a helpful term, but by your definition, yeah. it can be a very helpful term. Yeah. Do different forms of movement do different things? And what I mean by that is we've got in the common vernacular the, a term, the runner's high, mm -hmm. right? So I know you've written about this. I'd, I'd love to expand a bit on what that runner's high is and why everyone might not feel it. Um, but also, you know, I do like to run, um, but I also sometimes like to lift heavy weights. And I know if I have done a uh, heavy deadlift and as I'm walking out of the gym, like, I don't know, you feel strong, you feel powerful, yeah. you feel like you you feel like a different person walking out than the person you felt like walking in. So what is going on there? What is changing in your body? What is the runner's high? What are these, you know, endorphins that everyone talks about? Because as I read your book, Kelly, I more and more feel that reducing movement down to simply being about an endorphin high is That's far too it. simplistic. Yeah. Um so one thing so different forms of movement can affect your mood in two different ways you will get different changes in your brain chemistry based on what you're doing um, and also every movement form has its own qualities so you talked about feeling strong or powerful or confident um, and every movement form will bring something else out in you and so part of how movement makes you feel is what it is that it asks you to express. Are you expressing your determination, your playfulness and creativity, your ability to cooperate with others? Um, but the other part is, is actually different movement forms will lead to different changes in what's happening in your brain. So you mentioned the runner's high. Um, I call it a persistence high because it, it's a, a common effect in your brain. When you get your heart rate up a little bit and you're using your muscles to, to use energy, for about 20 minutes at a moderate intensity. And it really is about continuous movement rather than about running specifically. It's just that running, because it's so continuous, jogging actually is even a better way to get a runner's high than running. Um, it basically tells your brain, we're doing this, and so I need a payoff to help me continue doing it. And you can get this basic high from anything that puts your body in motion and you're willing to commit to it for, for about 20 minutes. And it's driven, uh, it seems to be driven not mostly by endorphins. Um, to get a true endorphin rush from movement, you typically need to add um, one of three things, more intensity, other people, or music. And if you add those, you can get an endorphin rush from pretty much any type of movement. But um, the classic runner's high is fueled by endocannabinoids, which as a brain chemical is different than endorphins in a way that I think is really interesting. So we know that endorphins tend to basically block pain and create euphoria, which is why, by the way, with the right playlist or when you're moving with other people, um, that that can really make you feel euphoric because that will really give you an endorphin rush or pushing yourself to like to, you know, fatigue. Um, but endocannabinoids, what they do is whatever is going on in your brain that we would think of as unpleasant, 
it starts to dampen it down. So endocannabinoids are basically, they modulate other systems of the brain. So if you've got pain, physical pain, if you've got stress, anxiety, anger, higher levels of endocannabinoids are basically going to calm those things down in your brain. And endocannabinoids also um, facilitate anything that is pleasurable. So anything good that's happening, it's going to amp up. Amp up. And uh, one of the things that it particularly seems to amp up is the pleasures of social connection. So when endocannabinoid levels are higher, um, everything that's pleasurable is more pleasurable, but like your story is more interesting. Your jokes are funnier. Um, if you give me a high five, it's gonna feel more satisfying. Or if you give me a hug, it's gonna feel better. Or if I'm able to help you, I'm gonna get more of that helper's high, that warm glow. And I think that's really interesting because, right, so endorphins make you feel really good. It's, it's like a high, but the runner's high is more about sort of putting you into a brain state that allows you to be a good version of yourself in community. And there's a lot of like anthropological speculation about why that would be, but the idea is basically human beings, we are adapted to be physically active and cooperate in communities. And as soon as you are, are moving your body and getting your heart rate up, your brain is like, oh right, we're hunting, we're foraging, we're gathering, and then we need to bring it back to our tribe and we need to share with one another and we need to feel good about the fact that I just you know, spent two hours out in the field gathering food and now I'm giving it away to other people so that they can eat. And that's what the runner's high is. It's a brain state that allows you to sustain optimism and effort and that makes you enjoy connecting with other people even more. And this is why exercise is like the best reset you can do for yourself. Because just imagine like every time you exercise, you're becoming that version of yourself. I, I mean, I'm blown away listening to this, Kelly. It, it is, it's, it's putting a lot of the pieces together that people kind of intuitively feel, but you're giving some of those mechanisms and some of the science behind why they feel the way that they feel. You know, I love looking at things through an evolutionary lens, and it makes sense when you look at it. Why, why would, why would it, why would it cause these things in the body? Yeah, it would bring us together. It would help us with our tribe, with our community. In fact, one of my favorite bits in the book is when you talk about uh, the Hatter tribe yeah. and what goes on, and then how much they move per day, and and also how they're elderly tend to move they tend to move more as they get older i think i read yeah it's you continue to be an active part of your community so it's one of the last hunter gatherer societies and i think the you know the research is that they are moderately to vigorously active for a couple hours a day that's like that higher intensity activity and then another couple of hours of sort of lighter to moderate activity like walking around um and I, you know the evolutionary idea is that that this is how humans survived. We were willing to exert ourselves because the climate changed and humans had to do that in order to feed themselves. And we were willing to cooperate and share. And uh, you know, one of the themes of, of the research as I experienced it and in talking to people is that you really, they are so connected. The rewards that we get from playing an active role in our lives, literally active, being engaged, exerting ourselves, pursuing meaningful goals and the rewards that we get from connecting with other people and being part of a community they are so connected that it's one of the reasons why people who are physically active are less lonely they have better relationships with other people there's something about being sedentary that makes it more difficult to be that version of ourselves that thrives in community and and i don't mean i that sounds I don't want to shame anyone who doesn't exercise or, or feels like they can't for physical or mental health reasons. And yet at the same time, I feel like it's really important to express this message that to whatever degree you can move your body, it makes you a different version of yourself that is not, it's not even just better for other people. It allows you to experience that core human joy of interdependence. Yeah. I mean, Kelly, we've both written books on stress and we know very well that exercise helps make us more resilient to stress. And, you know, one of the things I, I loved reading about in the book um, was how those areas of the brain that help us manage stress, the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, have got 
relatively high concentrations for endocannabinoids. Yes, and oxytocin, which is something else that can get released from exercise. Yeah, so okay, so how exercise helps us with stress, it is both on the sh that short term. So if you're feeling stressed mm. out, you're feeling anxious or angry, it's going to change your brain chemistry in a way that gives you more hope and more energy. That's like that's the common denominator. That's the feel better effect. But also we know that people who are regularly active, it actually changes the structure and the function of their brains in ways that that basically teaches the brain how to be resilient to stress and also more sensitive to joy. So you're going to have an increased availability of dopamine and endocannabinoid and endorphin receptors. Your brain is basically going to say, oh, I guess we can experience joy and meaning in life and hope and optimism. So let's just be ready for it um, in a way that increases people's um, mood and, and joy in a much more generalized way. Sorry to interrupt. If you're enjoying this conversation, there's loads more like it on my channel. Please do press subscribe and hit that bell. Now, back to the conversation. I think we're all walking around with this reservoir of untapped potential that we don't even know how good we could feel, how fit we could be, how well we could sleep, how much less stress we could feel in our lives if we found the right breathing technique for us that's going to suit, you know, our lifestyle and the way we choose to live. And I thought a good place to really think about this is by talking about uh, Swami Rama, who we didn't talk about last time, because I think he is really showing just how far you can go with this. And I, I'm not saying we all need to go that far, but I think it beautifully illustrates just what is possible when you really learn to harness the power of your breath. Yeah. And, you know, before we get into Swami Rama, I just want to mention, uh, pick up on one thing. We were just talking about kids and we didn't mention this in the first chat either, but since the book has come out and since you and I chatted, how many months ago was that? I've heard from so many sleep medicine researchers, people who specialize in pediatrics. And what I learned from them is that the pandemic of ADHD, about 10% of the population in the US suffers from ADHD. Most are kids from age two to five, and then it picks up again from ages around 12 to 17. But most ADHD is tied directly to breathing and breathing quality. And they showed me the percentages of 75% of kids who have ADHD also have sleep disordered breathing. And by improving their breathing during the day and during the night, so many of these kids can overcome what is considered this psychological or neurological problem. And that has just blown me away that simply breathing properly can have such a transformative effect. But then I was thinking about it more. I said, this shouldn't be shocking because if you're doing something wrong throughout the day, and if you're doing something 100% wrong for a third of your life, it's going to destroy your body. And that's what we've been seeing with these kids for with ADHD. And Dr. Stephen Park at Albert Einstein College of Medicine is doing some incredible work in this area as well, looking at what happens when you allow a kid to breathe better look at how quickly they're able to overcome some of these chronic issues. So I just wanted to tie that on uh, before we talk about Swami Rama. But in many ways, I view that these things are related because it just shows you the potential of what breathing can do, not only to heal us of some chronic issues, but to also put us up that next rung of human potential. And I think that uh, old Mr. Rama did that better than anyone. This is to give a little backstory on him. This is somebody who grew up in the Himalayas and he was taught yoga and breath work at the age of around four. Wow. And he stuck with it his whole life, spent years in a cave honing this skill. And he got so good at it that by the time he was in his 30s, he went off 
and traveled the world. He studied at Oxford. He studied at various universities. He knew like eight different languages. And he was so impressive that researchers at the Menager Clinic, which at the time was the largest psychiatric training facility in the US and the most renowned, a Navy physicist there had heard about all these things he was able to do. In other tests, he apparently was able to stop his heart with his just by focusing on his mind and breath. And he was able to increase the temperature in his fingers. And this Navy physicist didn't believe these stories, even though the data was right there. So he brought Swami Rama into his facility and conducted a battery of tests. And they found that he was able to remain conscious while he lulled his brain into a delta state. So the delta state are the states of very deep sleep. We're supposed to be unconscious. We're supposed to be asleep. But he was able to remain conscious during these states. So that was pretty impressive. But what impressed them even more was that he was able to control his heart rate. He was able to increase it about 20 beats per minute within a space of about eight seconds. And he was actually able to make it beat at a rate of more than 300 beats per minute with his mind. <laughs> and he did this for more than a minute. Um, that state, atrial fibrillation, is supposed to be, uh, you know, it will kill you after a while. But apparently Swami Rama could do this for about a half an hour to an hour. All of these things are medically impossible and no one would believe it unless there was a real doctor there, researcher there, recording the whole thing. And still, this was reported in the New York Times. So it was reported in Time Magazine. And still, I get letters from doctors that say, you should check your sources. This is obviously impossible. No one can do this. And, you know, how much more science do you need? Uh, but that has more to do with how people want to view the world than, than to actually look at data and numbers. So, Could he also change the temperature on his hand? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole laundry list of things this guy could do. <laughs> I, didn't want to I didn't want to bore you with it. But in another experiment, since you asked, of course, <laughs> he was able to take his hand and focus on his hand and turn one area gray from lack of blood flow and the other area bright red. And they went and they measured the temperature on the same hand and it varied by 11 degrees. So not only could he take over entire organs like the heart and the brain, but he could take over specific parts of his body and pinpoint where he wanted to control his conscious energy. And a few people who had studied with Rama have written me and they said, oh, you know, it was great to read that you were able to track down this research and track down these studies, but this was child's play to him. <laughs> this was apparently nothing. And he's, he's now passed away, but I am now currently trying to get a hold of some other people who have learned Rama's methods and who can do things that, according to them, I've not seen any of this, will really be make what Rama did in these studies seem very in, insignificant. So, uh, you know, COVID has put a big fork in that, but things are starting to open up. And I'm hoping to go back out into the field and, and to record and write about more of this stuff. I mean, it's interesting to hear the skepticism that will come back on these sort of extreme stories. You often you often get the skepticism around Wim Hof as well. Um, mm -hmm. It's still there, even though I think he's shown through a lot of science, a lot of real life people have adopted these and are writing and are sharing their experiences. So there's a lot of real world data out there as well. Yet there is that skepticism and it really speaks to what I was thinking about today, which is this this untapped reservoir of potential that we all have within us. You know, the body's pharmacy that we're not properly opening up and accessing. And 
I guess one of the reasons Vim has been so relatable to people is because, certainly in the Western world, I should be really clear, in the Western world, it's because, you know, he, you know, he kind of, the name Swami Rama, I guess, might put a block there for certain people. Oh, that doesn't apply to me. And of course, he was, you know, this guy was rocking meditation and breathwork at the age of four, which is fantastic, in the Himalayas as well. So it, it answered this kind of romanticism and mystique that people then sort of feel, well, that's not relevant for me. I live in the middle of a city. I've got to, you know, work six days a week. I've got to do this and take my kids to after school club. You know, it, it seems quite distant. Whereas Vim, I think to some people at least, feels a lot more relatable, but they both speak to the potential there because what what you've just described uh, Swami Rama doing, mind-blowing, incredible. But, you know, Vim has also done some incredible stuff where people have injected endotoxin, which would make most people sick. And through his breath, through his controlling his immune system, he doesn't get sick. And I, and I, I again, I've been thinking about this theme recently, that, yes, we want science. And I know we want science. And it's great to get the science to really give it that validation to spread the message. But it feels to me on some level that breathing is so fundamental to who we are as humans that there's almost a three-dimensional quality to breathing you know the life force the energy it gives us as soon as we stop breathing we die um that actually i wonder sometimes do we look at it through a very sort of one-dimensional reductionist scientific lens whilst that has merit i sometimes wonder if we're missing some of that broader picture that some, I guess, of these ancient practices may have been speaking about and talking about for many years? Well, I think when it comes to people's apprehension, there's nothing much I can do about that. And the last thing I want to do is to become an evangelist. I really want to be even keeled here and just provide what I have found. You know, I'm yeah. not the one doing the research here. I'm reporting, and there's a big difference in that. I think when you look at Wim Hof and Tumo, and I've gotten some blowback on this as well. I've had people say, it is impossible for a human to sit in snow for eight hours at a time and melt a circle around themselves without wearing any clothes. This is scientifically impossible. And then I'll send them the study done by Herbert Benson at Harvard Medical School that was published in Nature, the most esteemed scientific journal on the planet, that shows that people can do this with their breathing. And that's usually when I never hear back from these people again. And that's fine, right? So Wim has come up with the exact same resistance but the difference is he's not wearing a robe. He's not wearing beads. He drinks beer, eats pasta, plays guitar, you know, just like every other middle-aged adult male. And so that has made him very uh, approachable in many ways. He's also volunteered to do whatever study people want to do. And I think what he's discovered, especially with the study with the endotoxin, when they first shot Wim up, with uh, the endotoxin of E. coli, and he didn't suffer any symptoms. And they said, oh, you're just a weirdo. There's no, there's no way anyone else can do this. He's like, well, let me take a group of people that you can pick. I'm going to train them for four days, and then they're going to come back and do exactly what I did, which is exactly what happened. So I think that it's this kind of science in this accumulation of data which is so necessary. You'll, you'll certainly get to a point where people just don't want to hear about it. If you look at climate change, how many studies are there showing climate change is real? Like 1,200, 1,300? And you still have people saying, ah, I don't believe any of that stuff. What can you do about that? To, to me, you can just offer them information, right? And if they want to approach this in a scientific way with truly an open view, then they can do with that what, what they will and really look at the data. But when it comes to these superhuman feats of Swami Rama and Wim Hof and even Chuck McGee has, has these to a certain extent, I don't view these as superhuman at all. These are human abilities that each and every one of us can hone. 
And when we hone them, we can maybe not be able to sit in snow for eight hours at a time and melt a circle around us, but we can improve our health. And I think that that is Wim's most impressive and important message. He's saying, don't go to Everest and run a half marathon and bare feet and bare chested like me. I already did that. But why don't you take control of your breath? And then once you take control of your breath, you can use that to help establish better healthy habits throughout the day. And I think that's why he's resonated with so many people across the globe is because He's allowing them to use something that we are all born with, right? It's our own natural human body to improve our condition. It's beyond health as well, yeah. uh, James. It's, it, you know, everything we do in life, we're breathing whilst we're doing it, right? We take our breath everywhere with us. It's not, no part of our life is is lived separately to the breath and therefore improving our breath has the potential to improve every aspect of our life. You mentioned health, but our relationships can be significantly improved because if we can control our breath, we can breathe better, our stress levels will be lower, we we deal with stress and friction much better, your sleep quality can potentially be better. We spoke about that at the start, about nasal breathing at night. You know, yes, there's going to be an impact on chronic disease as well, but it's it is this three-dimensional kind of, this is sort of what I was getting at, that it, you, you don't live your life without your breath. So improving the quality of your breath absolutely can have profound benefits, whether you want to climb Everest in your shorts or whether you just want to get through the day better, calmer, more peace. You know, and I guess that's why as a doctor, I'm so passionate about breathwork. In each of my four books, Breathwork has come up in all of them, even though I write about different topics, because the breath is central to so many different aspects of our lives. I learned this from a sleep researcher and and biochemist. He said that we get most of our energy, not through food, but through our breath. So if you look at how glucose is broken down, it takes six times more oxygen than glucose to fuel us. And he broke down the whole chemical structure of how that works with oxidative phosphorylation. And and he said, so if you explain to people that, you know, all of the food that they're focusing on every minute of the day, all of the supplements, yes, food is incredibly important for health and for energy. Of course it is. But that food can't do any of its magic if you don't have the breath there as well, if you don't have that proper and efficient supply of oxygen. So just as you mentioned, this is not woo-woo new age stuff. This is the most basic biochemistry in the human body. And breathing has to be considered as important as what we eat and how much we exercise, and how well we sleep. It really does. And I think it's starting to. I think it's been pushed to the background for a little while now, but people are starting to recognize it. And just concerning how the human body is able to function better with breathing, and what happens when we put the body in a state of nature, there's a quote by Albert Svent Georgi, who won the Nobel Prize for his work in vitamin C, that that I love. And As you were talking, I was just reminded of this quote. He said, more than 60 years of research on living systems has convinced me that our body is much more nearly perfect than the endless list of ailments suggests. Its shortcomings are due less to its inborn imperfections than to our abusing it. That's pretty wordy, but what he's saying is the further we put ourselves away from nature, the sicker we're going to get. And the more we return to the state in which we naturally evolved, the better we can get. And breathing, again, is a huge part of that. Returning your breathing to the way your ancestors used to breathe. Not superhuman breathing, not super turbo breathing. Just regular, natural human breathing is all you need. Follow your ancestors as the guide or any of the other 
hundred different mammals in the wild right now. And that to me is really the best teacher as far as breathing is concerned. To breathe well and to breathe optimally, we need a certain physical structure. We need a certain posture. We need to be able to get into certain positions. And I've read somewhere in your work, James, that 30% of breathing is dictated by posture. Yet we're living in a society where many people have got rounded back, sort of craned out necks. There's many reasons for that. Sedentary jobs, smartphones, laptops, whatever it is. But you know, how, how does this play a role in our ability to breathe? Because some people will be hearing this and go, okay, James, you convinced me. I'm in. I'm, uh, I, w- I want to breathe better. I, I want to I get your book. I want to check out the techniques. I want to find the right one for me. But where does posture play a role and what can people do about that? Well, if you consider that in your chest right now are these two huge balloons, right? These, these are your lungs. And these balloons need to inflate properly and deflate for you to get a consistent and easy flow of air. And by getting that consistent and easy flow of air, you will be able to consistently and easily get a flow of oxygen, which is what is going to fuel all of your cells. So when we're sitting like this, hunched over, which is how I sit a lot, or if we're sitting on a couch with our feet up, And if we're walking around with our shoulders like this, even if we wanted to take a full and easy breath, we can't because we can't inflate those two balloons in our chest, those two lungs. So Dr. Belisa Vranich has done some amazing work in the biomechanics of breathing. And I talked with her recently and read her books and they're fantastic if you're looking at the biomechanics of breathing. And she has found that most of us tend to breathe up and down, right? But what we should really be doing is to be breathing out and in. Because what you want to do is you want to be engaging the diaphragm and inhaling the lungs, air into the lungs very softly. So in order to do that, your rib cage needs to be flexible, right? And if you think about what yoga does, what is yoga more than just a way of stretching your rib cage and your intercostals so that you can breathe more easily? So Vranich has this test, it's called the BIC test. And what you do is you place your hands and you put them above your hip bones and you breathe in and you want to feel your hands moving out laterally, not just your stomach going out. That's where a lot of people get it wrong. Like they think belly breathing is about pushing the stomach out. You want your your belly around here to expand outward and inward. And if you can do that, then you're breathing correctly. If you can't and you feel no movement there, then you're an up and down breather. And uh, the more you focus on this, on breathing out and in, the more you start to feel your diaphragm descent, descending in the proper way. And the more you, you start being able to breathe more easily. This has made an incredible difference for me in my understanding of breathing, not only that, but also in athletic performance, whether I'm surfing or running or whatever, to focus on breathing outward and inward instead of up and down. Yeah, it's incredible. And it's, I guess, what you're showcasing there is that it doesn't matter if your posture's a bit altered from years of not breathing well and being hunched over. I guess the the positive note is there's things you can do once you now to flip that switch in your brain and say, right, okay, I'm going to take breath seriously. I'm going to start working on certain things. I'm going to every day just try that and just see if I can get a bit more expansion out rather than up and down. I really think people are going to start to feel those differences. And as I said earlier in our conversation, they're going to start tuning into things that they, they weren't even aware of before. The first, well, one of the first things we did with you was uh, change your diet. Yeah. Because... I was um, so reluctant to that. <laughs> I called it the no fun food diet for a while. I remember. it's um, And again, 
just, I want to just outline what my philosophy was. My philosophy was, look, there are multiple things here that could be contributing. I don't know which is or not, right? But let's go through your body systematically and change what we can. Let's focus on the creation of health. Um, so we, you know, we, we basically change your diet to a, a very much like a whole food, fresh food diet. Um, so a lot of the things that you were used to having, we were cussing out. Yeah. Um, I know that I felt that this bloating issue that you had, I felt that you might have something called uh, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And I thought that was contributing in some way to your gut function and maybe contributing to your symptoms. There's some studies out there which suggest it might be. Again, I'm being very careful with my language because people get very inflamed with this stuff. And it's very easy for this stuff to get misinterpreted. But this was an approach of saying, let's look at all the things that might be contributing. You've been seeing doctors for years. You're on 20 pills a day. You're still not any better. The current approach you're taking is clearly not working. So let's take a different approach. Let's take an approach that at the very least is going to do no harm. Absolutely. You know, that's always my philosophy. So we made big change to your diet. Yes, you were resistant. I do remember that. I remember that day well. That's one day I actually do really remember. Do you? Absolutely. Um, do you ever watch the series? Do you ever watch the? Do you ever watch your episode? I used to watch. I know it sounds really sad, but I used to watch it quite a lot at the beginning of my recovery, just because it was a nice reminder of Where how well been. I was doing. I hadn't watched it for about eighteen months, but obviously before coming here, I did watch it again. What do you think when you watch it? It's like I don't recognise myself, to be honest. And I've learned, like, learned so so much. You know, I had no idea about the power of food. Yeah. You know, obviously with my size to me, it's not like. I'll be lying if I said I'm always 100% yeah. like into that diet particularly, but actually I prefer eating that way. You know, I don't bake the way that I used to because I know if I bake something, I will eat it. Um, yes, I still like cake and I still like chocolate, but it's nowhere near as before. You know, we don't really, I mean, we never, really, I mean, to be fair, we always, well, you know, always cut, we always try to cook from scratch anyway and we still do that but we don't you know we never bought jazz and we don't use jazz and even today you know and it's initially it was like I thought I was depressed and this is this is stupid thinking but this is when you don't think right we didn't engage the boys with that diet because we kind of saw it as a punishment almost yeah isn't this um, fascinating but like now, obviously, again, they're not perfect and it is a struggle getting a veg. And it's funny because they have a thing like, mum, don't tell what's in it. If I make a curry, don't tell what's in it. Because I know I'm going to put as much veg in as I can. And they're still reluctant. It's they're ridiculous, but it's like, you know, I'll make them, I don't eat the bread, but I'll make them wraps and I'll shove as many different coloured yeah. um, veggies in as possible. And I'll cut it up finally. I make soups because they'll eat the soups. And I can obviously, again, I, I blend it so they're not seeing it. Cameron's come around the most actually in that because he will, he's like, just put on my plate, I'll eat it. Just, it's fine. But it's, for me, if I'm, if I, I, I realised, me and he was sat there one night, we had this really nice fish and sweet potatoes. And I'm like, we're eating really nice meals and we're giving our kids crap. What are we doing? Buying them chocolate. Is that really a treat? What we're actually putting in the bodies? You know, so to me, I said with them, what we do is kind of halfway measures, which obviously you do then get halfway results. Yeah. But even Logan, it was funny because Logan is nearly 16 and he's eating so much. And he, even he can't binge the way they used to. He went, Mom, it's your fault because of healthy eating. <laughs> so it's like, and obviously, because he plays rugby, we're trying to encourage him to make yeah. sure he's eating, you know, nutritionally dense food. So it just took a while to sort of think, why are we eating well? And we're giving our kids who we love more than anything else in this world, why are we giving them rubbish? But you know what, Nicola, that is such a key point. We sort of feel, don't we, that sometimes that, oh, it's a punishment to have to eat well in a way that nourishes our body because our norm. Many of us, not all of us, but many people's their norm is to have a lot of highly processed um, junk food, a lot of quick convenience food. And I get it. People are busy. Life is tough. You know, people are rushing around. I totally understand it. But it is funny how we've got to that state in society where often it's seen as a punishment, eating well, nourishing our body with the right sort of information and fuel from foods is seen as a punishment. And But it's advertising if you think, I mean, again, with Zachary, we do a project where we go around the supermarkets and even he knows that all the junk stuff is usually on offer, it's usually advertised and marketed really well. Whereas the fresh food, the whole food isn't. The fact that you have this awareness and yeah. the fact that you and Ian realize after a while, it's like, hold on a minute, we're having all this whole nourishing foods, but we're not giving that to the kids. It's that is that is the journey we're all on, right? We have to figure this stuff out in our own time. I don't think anyone likes to be told what to do. 
Like, I think what, what's really exciting for me, and we will definitely explore this in the conversation, is that, you know, yes, we have text contacts and there was a bit of um, help after the series, but generally speaking, you have been empowered with this information. So you are responsible for your recovery. You're the one who's learned about your body. You know, the food choices I, I recommended were simply a trial for like four weeks, for six weeks. Let's try, let's see what happens. Does it improve your gut function? Does it improve your pain? If not, fine. But at least we can start to rule out things. And I I actually like, I'm a big fan actually of uh, a well-managed elimination diet. Sometimes, yeah, I did that for six months actually. Did I you? On it, yeah. yeah, and look, I think for, of course it's best to do this with a nutrition professional wherever possible. Um, but I think... I personally feel that a well-managed elimination diet can can empower people so much in terms of what different foods might be doing to them. I have so many patients who are like, yeah, I didn't realize every time I have dairy, my skin breaks out. That's exactly what happens with me and Zachary. Really? And it was really interesting because when Zachary was a baby, he ended up on lactose-free milk because I initially fed him. I didn't realize, again, I didn't realize I could just take the dairy out of my diet. So I went from was it, breastfeeding to bottle feeding and he had to be lactose-free. And initially they said, well, just try with the yogurt. And it's only because I went, obviously doing the elimination diet, I removed that. When I put that back in, I realized it made my throat cloggy. My skin yeah. goes spotty. Zachary's skin goes spotty. Doesn't have a, neither of us have a huge reaction to it. But again, he, I know he's, he's now on lactose-free products because I'm not, I can see the difference in his skin. And for me, this is what it's about. This is about empowerment, right? This mm -hmm. is about not telling people what they can and can't eat, but it's giving people the tools and they go, you know, I, I would say that the analogy for me is this, right? With anything to do with lifestyle. If someone wants to go out with their mates on a Friday night and have a few beers, right? To unwind after the week and they stay in the pub all evening, they often know that there is going to be a price to pay on the Saturday. They're going to have a headache. They're going to be a bit fuzzy headed. They're not going to be able to function properly. But presumably, they're making the decision to go out on a Friday night in that knowledge saying, I'm going to get enough enjoyment out of seeing my buddies on a Friday night to put up with the consequences tomorrow, right? On some level, they know that's going to happen. When With anything I do with a patient over lifestyle, my, my goal is to do the same thing, is to help them understand for themselves what different choices are doing. Then, once you've got that understanding, yes, yeah, up to the individual. My job is not to tell someone what to do. I'm never told, in my, in my eyes, I'm never told a patient what they should or shouldn't be doing. That's not what I feel I'm there to do. It's to empower them. And so you now figured out that when you have dairy, you know, you get clogged up, you might break out on your skin. So then it's up to you what you do with that. If, if at Christmas time, you decide, mm. hey, you know what? I really want to have this. And you're happy to put it with the consequences. Well, I feel, you're, I feel you should be allowed to do that. And to be fair, I do. And like I said, exactly. it is a choice and I'm far from perfect with it. It's just, I'm much more aware. So if, you know, it's, it's very rare that I, I, I do have dairy, but if I do, it's a, it's a deliberate choice that I'm making knowing that it's, but I'm not constantly subjecting my body to something that I know yeah. it's going to have a, a reaction to. And that's the key really. It's, I, I limit it rather than yeah. just ignore it. Yeah. And I love that. I really love that. And I think, you know, I'm not at all, just to be clear, I'm not telling everyone or, or I'm not suggesting everyone should stop eating dairy. I'm just saying many people feel better off it. My interpretation fundamentally, in a nutshell, what we did together was this. It was basically adopt the philosophy in my first book, The Four Pillar Plan, look at food, movement, sleep, and relaxation and tweak them all to suit you and suit where you're at. Uh, but then I think because you were so unwell, and because you were in so much pain um, and your energy was so poor, I had to give you some uh, supplements basically to support your mitochondria. So I think that it was like this four pillar philosophy with the short term use of um, two supplements in particular that were really there to help your mitochondria function better. Is that your recollection of what happened? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And are you needing any supplementation today or are you sort of? pretty much okay with your lifestyle. I'm not taking any supplements at the moment. See, and, and this, I think the whole issue about supplementation gets misunderstood with the public and the medical profession sometimes. Just to reiterate, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm just making this point particularly for the listeners here. When we use the term lifestyle medicine, I never want it to infer that people have done things to themselves. And I, 
I don't know if that was an issue that came, maybe that's how you might have felt at the start at some points. I love the term lifestyle medicine. Yeah. Initially, I interpreted that as being just food. Right. And I think so many people mistake lifestyle medicine as meaning food. And if anyone takes anything away from what we're saying today, I'd like them to know that actually lifestyle medicine is so empowering and it puts us back in control. And to me, that has just been phenomenal. And it's not just food. It's like you said, really what you did with us is the four pillar plan. You know, it's, and I recommend it to every single person I meet. Um, but actually we are also, I was, I don't want to speak for anybody else. Some of the, the way that I lived, I massively contributed to me becoming ill. Was that deliberate? Absolutely not. You know, there was no conscious thought of, oh, I want to make myself ill. But there's so many things actually that is it any wonder that eventually I became ill. Yeah. So we do do it to ourselves, but very much inadvertently. And there's no blame. And initially I blame. And this is one thing that really kills me with this illness is the guilt. The guilt haunts you. And it, obviously because I do have a support group in all the time, it's guilt, 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 guilt. And it's so misplaced. Yeah. You know, and it's it breaks my heart actually that the number of people who feel that guilt and I felt it too. And I, I still remember that I kept saying to Ian, I would not blame you in the slightest if you left me. I remember you know, and I truly meant it because I would not want him to have lived with me. But now I look back and think, why on earth did I say that to him? Why was I keep pushing him away? You know, it's I was I was ill. It wasn't done intentionally. There were things, there was extraneous factors that got involved that wasn't my fault, but there were definitely things that I do hold myself responsible for. Um, and I know that's not everyone's case, but in my case, it definitely was. Um, but I was just constantly saying, I wouldn't blame you if you left. If Ian got ill, you know, if you broke his leg, I was like, I'm not looking after you. Yeah. You know, and it's... It's, 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 um, there's so many things that come up from that because I think what you said about, um, life medicine, I think is such a beautiful way of, of talking about it. I think that's the funnest thing for me about this whole field is that you empower people. People feel that they've got a sense of agency, a sense of control now over what happens rather than being at the whim and, and, and all whatever the illness wants to do, you've actually got some control. You taught me to listen to my body. And for the first time in my life, I actually started to begin slowly, it did take a while to understand my body. I no longer ignore my body. You know, yeah. it, it, your body is so clever, isn't it? it? It actually tries to tell you that things are going wrong yeah. and it is so easy to be dismissive. Um, and that in itself is empowering. If you enjoyed that conversation, I think you are going to love the one I had with the incredible immunologist, Jenna Machoki, all about the immune system. It's right there. So give it a click and let me know what you think. And click here to download my free breathing PDF. Gut bugs, the microbiota, are one of the key educators of the immune system. 